me here. One moment. Oh. James, you all set? Sorry, I need to briefly close and reopen Zoom. Yeah, I don't see your screen yet, Levin. Yeah, I need. To. Yeah, sure. That's uh, that's we have a few minutes, right? Kind of way to minimize the screen, right? Here we go. Yeah, I'm just there we go. Okay. So now it should work better. That looks better. Is it okay? Do you see the proper screen? Unfortunately, it's only about the left third of your screen that we see here. Let's see, is this better? And that's the other view, probably. That's perfect, right there. Oh, this is good. All right. Yeah. So we have it online too. Look good there. Okay. We have a few minutes leaving, and then uh, I'll give you introduction, and we'll aim yeah. for roughly forty minutes, and then five minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah, I'll aim for that. Let's quickly get a glass of water. I'll be back in a moment. Some pretty substantial lunch boxes. It's a long day. It's gotta be a long day for you. I know these things are stressful. Just we have enough to eat. So. Thanks. This is everything that's good. Yeah, All right, uh, so welcome back everybody. Um, so we'll start the afternoon session. Uh, and so this session is um, quantum computing implementations one. So we'll have one of these every afternoon. Um, and so uh, before we go on, I just want to um, ask all the remote participants uh, to please put your questions in just the Q&A so we make sure we see them because if they're in the chat and the Q&A, sometimes we can't see both. Um, so just put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our chair for the session, uh, Jason Petta, who will also talk tomorrow. So Jason. All right, thank you, Vinita. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is a plentiful lunch, so try to stay awake here as we move into the afternoon. It's a great pleasure to have Levin van der Slypen joining us remotely from Delft. Uh, Levin has been a professor at Delft since about 2003. Uh, he had his PhD from Stanford 
2001, did some really famous experiments with Ike Chuang and was the first to factor 15 uh, using an NMR-based uh, quantum processor. Levin's area of research is focused on semiconductor spin qubits now, and his group's really been pioneering in this effort with some of the first demonstrations of single spin readout and electron spin resonance, and uh, very recently, some nice results that have pushed spin qubits into new terrain with very high two qubit gate fidelities. Uh, Levin is a recipient of numerous awards, but maybe one thing to highlight in today's meeting is he's a recipient of the Spinoza Prize, which is one of the highest honors that can be bestowed upon a scientist in the Netherlands. So thanks again for joining us, uh, joining us Levin, and everything looks good here. If you want to go ahead, that'd be great. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Jason, for your nice introduction, and thank you, Vanita, uh, and colleagues for the invitation, and, and congratulations, of course, on, on your new master's program and, and new uh, quantum information science program at the Department of Physics, and it's a, it's a pleasure to, to join this inaugural uh, event. Of course, the whole, the whole event is about, you know, frontiers in quantum computing, and, and I think what we all share is the prospect and the motivation that you know, one day uh, we'll be able to um, solve problems that are really relevant, that are going to have impact on society, and that are essentially, for all practical purposes, impossible to solve by, by any uh, conventional computer, even the most powerful supercomputer we can imagine. And this relates to, or this, this uh, is, is uh, the case, for instance, for computing the properties of complex materials, properties of molecules, and, and they have really, you know, brought potential impact in, in uh, designing new materials for, you know, energy storage, energy harvesting, or molecules for, uh, you know, that are uh, better catalysts than what we have today, or fertilizers, or, um, you know, design new medication more efficiently, etc. You know, there's, of course, also uh, possible applications in, in encryption, code breaking, and so forth. Uh, but if we look at the known applications that are really of value to society, and if we look at the, the fact that any qubit uh, that we can imagine today is, is you know, subject to, to decoherence, um, uh, then, then quickly between uh, needing hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of perfect qubits to solve these problems and needing a overhead, a redundancy for correcting the errors from decoherence that, you know, that can be one in a thousand, one in, one in 10,000 again, uh, then quickly we arrive at requirements for devices that contain many, many millions of quantum bits. So, so that is in the end really what we're after, right? And so the question is, how do we go from the current state of the art symbolized by this beautiful experiment of the Google team two years ago to a future device that contains millions of qubits with, uh, that are all really well under control, you know, where, where all the operations can be performed with high fidelity, so how do we go from this quantum supremacy or quantum advantage um, as a mathematical demonstration or, or as, a, you know, as, as, a, as a demonstration of principle to, to really quantum practicality? And, and that is a big, you know, the big question uh, that we're all trying to answer in a variety of ways. Now, um, I would like to argue that if your starting point is the semiconductor technology that has really, you know, driven the information age and, and has allowed billions of transistors to be integrated on a, on a processor or memory chip, then you have a good starting point for, for scalability. And, and what is more, um, if in such a device, you know, which, which actually resembles a lot of transistor, you know, here's a contact, here's another contact, and then normally there is a single gate covering the channel that connects the sources and the drain contacts, right? Here, here you have several gates side by side, but it still resembles a, a, a transistor. Um, if in such a device, you imagine using the spin of a single electron as a quantum bit, then as it turns out, and as I will show, um, the, that actually makes for a very good qubit with long lived coherence and many benefits that I'll try to highlight uh, throughout the talk. So in order to do this, we need to first of all isolate individual electrons in this channel. And the way that this is done nowadays, and this is um, um, you know, a technique that, that actually uh, Jason uh, really contributed to, is, is um, along this channel, you have two gates here in orange that, that well, uh, along the space between the contacts. You first create a channel using the gates in orange, and then you overlay a bunch of split gates with which you shape the potential landscape. 
And if you look at the potential landscape along that red dashed line here, you can shape the potential landscape such as shown on the right, where a single electron is confined underneath that second narrow gate here. A single electron is confined below the fourth gate and they are separated from each other by a tunnel barrier, which is controlled by that intermediate third gate. And, and they're also separated from the reservoirs that contain lots of electrons, um, um, again, using tunnel barriers. So, so um, in the image, what you see additionally to, to this channel containing the quantum bits, the electrons that act as quantum bits, is um, a second channel in which a single quantum dot is going to be formed. And as we'll uh, see throughout the talk, the, the, the current or the conductance through this additional channel is actually extremely sensitive to how many electrons there are in each of these uh, local potential minima, in each of these quantum dots. And, and that's gonna be actually the, the, the standard technique for probing the properties of the, of the quantum dots and probing the properties, the states of the, of the qubit. So that's the, that's, the, that's the starting point. Now, if you look at the development of the ideas in our community, uh, there was really a way, a first wave of developments that was based on Gallimarsnight technology. Gallimarsnight has been the workhorse of, of basically, yeah, you could say semiconductor mesoscopic physics for you know, uh, 15 plus years. And with that technology, several groups, including ourselves, demonstrated all the key elements that you need to put together to think of a processor based on electron spins in semiconductor quantum dots. So that includes, for instance, a readout, single shot readout of a single electron spin in a quantum dot. Um, that includes magnetic resonance, driving coherent rotations between the two spin states. Um, and it includes um, the coherent exchange, first shown by Jason and others at Harvard, whereby in time, two electrons evolve from the up-down state to the down-up state and back to the up-down state uh, periodically. Um, so as it turns out, if you have control of the exchange and of single spin rotations, that's, uh, that's enough actually to, to, to um, achieve universal control and to program arbitrary sequences. Now, whereas we found early on that the T1, the spin relaxation time, uh, can be really long, let's say up to a second or so, um, even longer. In Galia Mars night, what was limiting us was T2, in particular T2 star, the dephasing time, the time scale on which the spin loses uh, coherency if you just leave it by itself, is you know 10 to 30 nanoseconds, something like that. And using dynamical dynamical decoupling techniques, echo spin echo type sequences, you can extend this to some to some level. But still, the starting point of you know tens of nanoseconds of coherence is really limiting, and so the whole field really received a second strong push when it became possible to develop similar devices, not in gallium arsenide but in silicon. The reason is that in gallium arsenide, all the atoms, all the isotopes that exist in nature carry a nuclear spin, and even though we work at low temperature and in a large magnetic field, the, the, the nuclear spins are randomly oriented and collectively they, they um, impart a random um, Overhauser field, nuclear field on the electron spin. And, and so, yeah, a random effective magnetic field acting on the electron spin means that it quickly defaces. So it was known from the beginning that if you could do the same uh, physics in silicon-based devices, you know, you would be in much better shape. And in particular, um, if you could do it in in substrates that are made from isotopically enhanced or enriched uh, silicon 28, which is an isotope that has zero nuclear spin. And so indeed, uh, in 2014, the Jura group um, at UNSW showed a T2 star of 100 microseconds. So that's four orders of magnitude longer than, than was observed typically in gallium arsenide. And, and um, you know, again, with dynamical decoupling that can be extended in this case to tens of milliseconds. Uh, correspondingly, single qubit gate fidelities have now been pushed to well beyond three nines, in some cases approaching four nines of fidelity. Um, so, so, you know, excellent single qubit control is possible now based on these uh, clean environments. And, you know, putting all these elements together, we actually had fun programming small sequences, simple sequences, uh, taking, the, taking in this case two qubits through the steps of, um, you know, some of the basic quantum algorithms that we know, Grover and Dostos algorithm, 
for two qubits. Okay, so that's that's a good that's good. You know, that's kind of warming up. But but where is this going? Um, so with a number of colleagues around the world, we we uh, wrote down, collected a number of ideas, added some ideas of, of what a future uh, quantum processor based on electron spins and quantum dots could look like. And the vision is as follows: we would have, or imagine, on a chip, a local array of quantum dots, likely a two-dimensional array of sorts. Where at the moment I don't know, I can't tell you what what the dimensions would be. You know, is it going to be uh, eight by two, or is it going to be eight by eight, or something else? That's going to be part of a big trade-off. So we'll op we'll need to optimize that. But some some local register, and then scaling beyond would happen by having replicas of this unit cell on the same chip. So the entire image you see here, you have to imagine that all happens on a single semiconductor chip. And that means that these local registers need to be connected to each other on the chip using quantum links so that entanglement can be distributed across the whole device. And where we also allow space for classical electronics to be co-integrated with the chips, you know, after all, sorry, co-integrated with the qubits. So, so after all, if the, if the qubits are made uh, with silicon semiconductor, well, with silicon technology, semiconductor manufacturing, then, then yeah, it's really possible to, to integrate classical electronics. And, and why is that important? It's important to overcome one of the biggest practical obstacles to scaling these electrically controlled devices. And it is that today, every qubit needs to be adjusted or controlled by through a single wire connecting to the electronics. And, and so that, that at some point is no longer feasible and then it becomes necessary to, have, to bring in a limited number of wires to the chip and from there distribute them to the qubits using some classical electronics. Um, that is possible not only because you know, they, share the both, they, they share the same silicon technology, but also because, and, and I won't really go into that further in this talk for the, for the sake of time, but it's, it's possible also because it turns out that these semiconductor spin qubits are relatively resilient to temperature. They can be operated at the Kelvin, you know, even beyond the Kelvin. Of course, with you know, some sacrifices in particular in T1 and, and maybe charge noise. And so then it becomes the question, you know, what is the optimal operating temperature? Again, some multifaceted freedom. So what I would like to focus on in this talk is first, um, um, show you that we can indeed, as, as Jason mentioned in the, in the introduction, achieve very high fidelity two qubit gates, which is an important element for making this work. I'll show you circuits uh, on a six qubit device. Uh, I'll show you progress on coupling spins at a distance mediated by microwave photons on chip. And, and I'll show you uh, some results working together with Intel aiming at, at you know, ultimate scaling of this technology. So starting with, with the high gate or the high two qubit gate uh, operation, the, the state of the art uh, two years ago is, is captured here, right? So um, I, I referred before to the Heisenberg exchange interaction that exchanges the state of two spins. In the experiments on this slide and in, in what I'll show, there is actually a sizable energy difference between the two qubits that we're going to couple. And as a result, the flip-flop terms in this exchange interaction are suppressed. And what we're left with is the ZZ Ising interaction. So that is the Hamiltonian that will be the basis for a two qubit gate. Now, as we turn on the, the tunnel coupling, you know, that, that controls this, this exchange coupling of the spins between adjacent dots, um, um, the way you, can, you know, what, what happens to the energy levels is, is that the anti-parallel states here um, are pushed down in energy relative to the parallel spin states, which here we draw as uh, just horizontal. And so as a result, if you crank up this exchange coupling, you can now rotate the first qubit depending on the state of the second qubit. So if the second qubit is down, we need to apply the yellow frequency and it's off resonance from this upper transition. If the second qubit is up, we need to drive at the red frequency to rotate the first qubit. And, and if the first cube, well, if the other qubit, the second qubit is down, it will be off resonance. So this is basically allowing you to perform conditional rotations. And the Zura group in, in Silicon 28 devices achieved a 98% control drop fidelity already two years ago. 
Alternatively, you can use the same interaction and briefly turn it on and back off without any microwave drive. And if you do this adiabatically so that you maintain, so that you stay in the same eigenstate, what will happen is that the anti-parallel states pick up an additional phase compared to the parallel spin states. And so that's the basis for a controlled phase gate. And, and so um, in natural silicon, uh, two years ago, we showed a 92% C phase or CZ uh, fidelity. So that's the starting point and that's the, the physics. So what we did then is to um, build a device and, and really work hard on, on getting um, accurate control of the spin dynamics uh, in order to really you know, push the fidelity. Uh, what it means for starters is to um, work hard to ensure good adiabaticity of the, of the spins, of, of, the, of, the, of the process, so that we really stay in the same eigenstates. To do that, you want to turn on the exchange smoothly and turn it back off uh, smoothly. Uh, essentially, we, we uh, aim here at cranking up the exchange um, via a, a cosinusoidal uh, profile. But then we have to keep in mind that as we change the gate voltages, the gate voltages have a nonlinear, almost exponential um, um, effect on the exchange coupling. So our control knob is gate voltages to, to raise or lower the tunnel barrier and, and modulate the overlap of the two wave functions of the electrons that, that define the, the spin exchange strength. So that's what we modulate. And what we want in the end to control is the exchange. And so therefore, we, we sort of invert the transfer function from gate voltage to, to exchange and, and apply this particular shape to the gate voltage in order to get this exchange. So that's one element. A second element was conceptually shown in other experiments five years ago, and it is to operate at the so-called sweet spot, where, where you have a minimal uh, influence of charge noise from the environment. And then um, finally, we started out by carefully manually calibrating using known protocols such as Ramsey sequences, all XY sequences, and so forth. And then we um, characterized the, the process of our two qubit gate, actually of all of the gates, using gate set tomography. And gate set tomography gives you a fidelity, a gate fidelity number, but it also gives you detailed information on the, on the errors uh, compared to the ideally targeted gate. And so we used that information to improve the calibration. And in this way, we were able to push the fidelity routinely to, to well above 99.5%. Uh, so that is a good place to be in. You know, people often refer to the 99% threshold. Of course, you know, that needs to be seen in, the, in, in its context, but it is a widely used benchmark. And um, I should say similar, you know, I, I think this, this is, yeah, therefore really a good position to be in. And, and I wanna mention uh, a bit later also that the Rucha group uh, published similar results and, and the Morello group on, on phosphorus donors also in silicon uh, also achieved um, two qubit gate fidelities, everyone above 99%. Um, at this point, from analyzing the error generator, we uh, can infer that the, that the gate fidelity is limited by incoherent um, errors, um, but also there, I think there is, there is uh, room for improvement. So we then actually put this high fidelity gate to use. We actually um, employed it in this variational quantum ICO solver setting or algorithm where you know it's, it's kind of a toy problem. It's, it's uh, mapping the binding energy of a hydrogen molecule onto the state of two qubits and then tweaking a parameter using a classical feedback loop after running a quantum circuit. This has been done before using cat ions or superconducting qubits. Um, and, and here um, we, we uh, implement it on, on the spin qubit uh, system. It's, it's actually an algorithm that, that allows you to you know, benchmark quantitatively how well your system is doing. In this case, we're at 20 milli hungry. Um, uh, without cutting corners on, on, the, on the accuracy. Um, and you know, that is kind of similar to what was achieved with uh, the other systems with, with similar gate fidelity some years back. Um, so that was two qubits. And, and of course, you know, we had to break through this barrier, uh, but we also want to break through the barrier. Well, to, through, well, we had to break through the barrier of the, of the, of the threshold of the fidelity, let's say. 
But obviously, we also need to move on to larger systems. Um, you know, as I said, several groups have shown uh, a respectable two qubit gate uh, fidelities, also demonstrated an entanglement. Um, then there is uh, work here uh, from Jason uh, controlling in a four dot a day, one qubit at a time. Work from my colleague, Menno Feldhorst. This is now in Germanium, but otherwise similar technology. Uh, controlling four qubits, universal control of, uh, of a four qubit system. The Terucha group reported entanglement of three spins. And what I'd like to show you here is a six qubit device. This is a third generation of, of uh, such a device um, on, on material from my colleague, Jordana Scapucci, and fabricated uh, in house. This oh, I, I forgot to mention the previous experiment uh, was, was uh, work from uh, Xiao Shui and uh, uh, theoretical input from Maxus. Um, this experiment here is done by Stefan Phillips and Mateusz Matzik and fabrication by Delphine Bruce and Sergei Amitonov with, with contributions of, of quite a few others, of course. So uh, this device has a linear array of six quantum dots. It follows sort of this, this prototypical layout, um, alternating you know, plunger gates that control the potential of each of the dots and barrier gates that control the tunnel barrier between the neighbors. At the ends, you see these regions indicated in red, which are larger quantum dots. This is, this is uh, where we have positioned here the uh, extra quantum dots that we use as charge detectors, as sensing dots. So um, to, to initialize and measure the system, we actually implemented several elements that, that are you know, kind of novel in the, in the quantum dot setting. One of them is uh, we use a combination of Pauli spin locate readout to compare the spin of the first two uh, spins or you know, of the electrons. Um, and then you know, we, we perform this readout. Uh, then we map the state of the third qubit onto the second and we repeat the readout. And that then allows us to infer uh, also the state of the third qubit. And similarly here, we measure the parity of the last two qubits. Then we map the fourth onto the fifth and we repeat that parity measurement of the last two so that we can also read out the fourth. Um, for initialization, we actually don't load fresh electrons from the reservoirs. In fact, the six electrons stay in place all the time. The reservoirs are not needed uh, as far as the qubit register, register is concerned. Um, and um, what we do is we, we start off in a basically a random state. It's whatever you ended up with in the previous run of the experiment. Um, we perform our measurement and depending on the measurement outcome, we will flip the qubits so that we can actually um, initialize by measurement and real-time feedback. So um, in this way, uh, you know, it turns out that we get uh, quite quite good uh, both initialization and readout fidelity, as you can tell, for instance, from the visibility of uh, the Rabi oscillations of each of the six spins. So there's no, no, no normalization here. This is just the, the, the raw probabilities as they are measured. Um, and um, uh, we, we tweaked here the Rabi frequencies of the six qubits so that they would be uh, yeah, basically just as fast as one another. I, I need to point out all the six qubits are present, but we don't drive the rotation simultaneously. So we rotate one qubit or the second or the third. Um, um, and and um, the way that we selectively address them is again using the fact that, that the qubit frequencies are all shifted apart a little bit. That's because of a piece of cobalt, two pieces of cobalt actually placed above the quantum dots, which produce a magnetic field gradient. Uh, the single qubit gate fidelities are close to three nines across the array. And you see here the, the uh, numbers for T2 star, basically, let's say three to five microseconds or so across the array. This is single qubit control. Um, for two qubit operations, we want to be sure that we can turn off and on the individual exchange interactions one at a time. And so uh, they can be activated, each of them, with on-off ratios in excess of 100. And so um, putting these elements together, we can show or prepare bell states. These are actually bell states, I would say, with, with pretty similar fidelities to what was state of the art in two qubit devices just two or three years ago, um, but now achieved consistently across the array. And, and here are then uh, three qubit 
entangled states states uh, of the GHZ type uh, of, of the groups of three qubits across the array. If you look closely, you see that uh, when two of the inner qubits are involved, the, the uh, density matrix is more mixed than, than otherwise. And that is basically because in this experiment, for uh, technical reasons that we only partly understand, the, um, if we initialize everybody, everybody together, um, the, the middle qubits are not as um, low entropy as the, as the outer ones. But so yeah, this is you know kind of where we are. I think as a field in in uh, multi qubit uh, control and uh, building on from here. So this was like I said on locally made devices, but I'm convinced that eventually, if we want to put together millions of qubits that all work, it's going to be essential to have access to the facilities of the uh, of the semiconductor industry. And so here you see um, work done jointly with uh, the team of Jim Clark and colleagues at, at Intel, um, where you know, um, we, we designed together a set of masks uh, to fabricate qubit devices, really with the you know, advanced semiconductor manufacturing technology. You know, there's, there's no electron beam lithography, no liftoff, none of the kind of uh, convenient and flexible tools that we use in, in typical academic experiments. Um, so that, that actually introduces a lot of challenges you know, for, for making this uh, work. But in, over the past years, um, that, that's what the Intel team with our input has achieved. And, and if you look now at a cross section of the gate stack, you know, here, here's an SEM image. Uh, maybe you recognize a bit the idea from before. You know, there are contacts here and here, and then some set of split gates to shape the potential landscape. Uh, same pattern across for charge sensing. If you look at uh, you know along this this line here, you you see this beautiful uh, uh, cross section of the gates. The gates are deposited in two layers, so the odd ones all, all look quite identical, and also the even ones all look quite identical. If you compare that to a device from from ourselves in Delft, then I think this is not so uncommon for academic uh, uh, tools. You know, the, the, there's no comparison in the, in the quality of the, well, in the homogeneity, let's say, of, of the device. If you look at the qubit performance, it's actually, you know, ballpark uh, similar numbers to, to what we find in, in, uh, in the literature, T2 stars here of tens of uh, microseconds. Um, so that's a respectable T2 star uh, with, with dynamical decoupling. We push it up to three milliseconds. Gate fidelity is actually not even optimized. is easily above two nines. Uh, so that's all good. But I think the unique um, advance here is that across a full 300 millimeter wafer, um, of all the devices tested, 98% were fully functional uh, at, at room temperature. And so what that means is that the device turns on, the current is, you know, responds to each of the gate voltages that it should respond to. Um, and yeah, it's, it's basically fully functional. And, and um, in our lab, that number is, let's say between, between zero and 20% on a, on a really good day. Uh, well, I think at one time it was, it was close to 50%, but usually it's 10 or 10 or 20%. Um, so this is a much better starting point uh, to, to, to go to scaling. And then actually the, the ones that didn't work are, are all on the perimeter of the, of the wafer, you know, even so. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, looking at, at uh, scaling um, by, by having access to technology. But I mentioned there is another aspect to scaling and it is, it is these quantum links. And that's the last topic I'd like to cover. Um, what we would like to do here is to couple spins at a distance through a microwave photon, which is stored in a on-chip superconducting resonator. So these resonators are, of course, well known from the superconducting qubit community. And um, we've adopted them now also you know, in our community for some years, uh, into co-integrating them with the quantum dots. And in 2018, uh, a big step forward was taken by three groups, including ourselves and, and uh, Princeton and ETH, um, by uh, achieving for the first time the strong coupling regime where, between a single microwave photon and a single electron spin. So what that meant is that the uh, 
coherent coupling between the spin, the electron spin and the microwave photon was larger than both the uh, cavity photon uh, decay rate and the spin dephasing rate, the T2 star. So that was a good starting point because you know that was sort of uh, needed to, to be able to imagine coherent, uh, yeah, coherent interactions through this quantum, quantum link. Um, as the next, well, and so, so this was all done with a single resonator and, and a single electron in a double quantum dot at the end, at one of the ends of the resonator. So now we move on to two quantum dots, actually two double quantum dots, each at one end of the resonator. Um, and uh, we would like now to couple both to the resonator and through the resonator, couple the spins to each other. Um, to, to do that, we uh, first, uh, or, or well, to, to test that, we first go back to the same regime. So that is the, the resonant regime where a uh, single, uh, well, where, where the, well, you know, where, where the electron spin and the photon get on resonance with each other. And where again, we find that the level repulsion here, repulsion, the, the avoided level crossing, which uh, tells you the, the coupling strength between the spin and the photon is larger than the cavity decay rate and larger than the spin dephasing rate. So we achieve st the strong coupling regime on the one end and on the other end independently. And then, and this is actually uh, following the steps of, of uh, Borjans of, of last year, um, then we activate the coupling at both sides simultaneously, and you get this enhancement of the collective coupling, the square root of two enhancements that you expect for the avoided level crossing here. So that in indicates a coherent interaction between one spin and the microwave photon and the other spin. They, they kind of are all, they're all interacting together. But what we are really after in the end is to couple the two spins to each other, leaving out the microwave photon. And so to do that, we here go to the dispersive regime. So we tune our qubit frequency away from the microwave resonator frequency. Then um, we bring the resonance frequency of the two qubits on resonance with each other. And I didn't point that out, but in the device, the pieces of cobalt are here placed at an angle and the angle is different uh, for one pair and for the other pair, so that the, the, the qubit splitting also responds differently if we rotate the external magnetic field. And so if we then bring these two on resonance with each other, still off resonance, off resonance from the resonator, um, we find that mediated by virtual occupation of the photons in the microwave resonator, um, also the two spins interact, interact with each other. And in this case, with a coupling strength that again exceeds the spin dephasing rate. So that is, I think, you know, the regime that, that uh, can then be used to uh, next hope to see time evolution uh, where the spin, the spins on the, on the two ends uh, exchange with each other. Um, and and uh, yeah, in this way, you can create a, a, a remote two qubit gate. The device here um, didn't allow us to do that in the, in the conditions that we were measuring, but it's something that we'll uh, aim for next. However, an observation that we did make, and that's kind of cute, is if we, uh, you know, we, we, we were looking at the, or we were trying to measure the line width of the, of the, spin, uh, of the spin resonance signal. And we were initially bothered that the line width was asymmetric. Um, and and um, at some point we realized that we should have been expecting this. What was happening is that the spin frequency was actually measuring the number of photons in the resonator. You see it most clearly in this cross section where this is the main dip. And then you clearly see the next dip corresponding to a single microwave photon in the resonator. The dip for two photons is not so visible, but the first, uh, the first two are clearly distinguished from each other. So, so actually it's a measurement of the resonator occupancy through the spin resonance frequency. So summarizing these, these uh, four results, right? So we are now able to uh, achieve two qubit gate fidelities well beyond the 99% threshold. Uh, we can put together circuits with up to six quantum dots, six qubits, and control all of them. Um, we have seen 
the coherent interaction between two spins at the distance mediated by virtual occupation of the of, of the microwave photons in the resonator and qubits made in the intel advanced manufacturing facilities achieve basically uh, uh, similar um, specs as what was demonstrated in the literature in terms of qubit performance but with a um, yield that has no comparison to, to what is possible um, in, well, certainly in our lab and I think in most labs. So before closing, um, let me briefly highlight that the same quantum dot devices can actually be used for a completely different purpose. And that is to emulate directly interesting physics that we would like to understand better, uh, generally you know, of the Fermi Hubbard type, because these are fermions, the electrons, can hop between sides, there is an interaction energy. This is Fermi Hubbard physics. And so just um, briefly stating here, three experiments that, that um, indicate the three levels of physics that we've looked at. In the first experiment, the, the relevant physics was multi insulator physics driven by electron, electron interactions, just charges. Next experiment was seeing evidence of Nagaoka ferromagnetism. That's a form of ferromagnetism, of itinerant ferromagnetism predicted more than 50 years ago and not seen in any physical system so far. That one is actually driven by, by the hopping, the tunnel coupling between the sites. And then most, most, recently, most recently, an experiment where the spin exchange is the dominating energy scale in the, in the physics. Here we um, were able to prepare the ground state of the Heisenberg spin chain and also see the coherent evolution of the full four spin system in this case under uh, the Heisenberg, uh, well, and under the exchange interaction. So I think also a very promising direction and, and both, well, the computing and, and simulation work feeds a lot into each other. So, yeah, I think looking back at, at this vision, you know, as a community, we are really able to put together all of the elements one by one. Uh, I think we're on a good trajectory. Um, and, and I'm getting more optimistic that large scale integration of these qubits will be feasible. Of course, we need to demonstrate that. Um, in the meantime, you can play with our qubits uh, as, as well as with those of, uh, of Leo De Carlo and his team on superconducting qubits through this uh, platform, online platform, Quantum Inspire. This is um, the first European quantum computer in the cloud uh, and, and a fully uh, public uh, endeavor, no, no uh, commercial endeavor. Finally, of course, all of this work is really uh, you know, done by, by uh, a great team. Here is a Corona compatible picture from a year and a half ago now, um, but uh, the, the, the group of people contributing both internally and externally is of course much larger and, and their input has really been, been key to, to all of our work. So with this, I would like to thank you all and uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Nidan, for the very clear presentation. Are there any questions from the audience here? Any takers? Yeah, do you mind stepping up to the microphone, please? And if you're remote, feel free to type in a question to the Q&A here on Zoom. So we have one question coming up here, Lieben, from someone in the audience. I rather have a, a more like physics question. Um, what is the characteristic size of uh, your quantum dot system? Is it from, from the figures that I saw, it's about 20 nanometers, is that the right scale? Um, well, uh, let me bring up this image. So this is um, showing a, a, I would say rather typical device where the pitch between the quantum dots is in this case 90 nanometer, but it's, it's often, let's say between 70 and 120 nanometer. Those are typical pitches between the quantum dots. Seven to 20. Between, between uh, 70 and 120 nanometer. Oh, okay. okay. And, yeah. and the decoherence times of like uh, 20 or 30 microseconds, those at room temperature or? Uh -huh. uh, I didn't mention, so all these experiments are, um, so thanks good. for asking, all these experiments are done at low temperature. Low means uh, typically dilution refrigerator, so let's say 20 millikelvin, although the electrons are a bit warmer, let's say 100 millikelvin. Um, what I didn't show, but I'll maybe briefly bring that up here, is that um, 
also a pretty good operation can be achieved at, for instance, the Kelvin. So this is work um, driven by my colleague, Menno Veltorst at QTEC, um, where you know, quite decent uh, single and two qubit gate fidelities are achieved at the Kelvin. And this is just the starting point. So these numbers are also going to go up if we, if we push harder. Um, so that actually is, is nice that they are, that the qubits are somewhat resilient to temperature. So we, we call them hot qubits. Of course, that all depends a bit on your perspective, uh, but for us, that's hot. And maybe one more question. Uh, again, it's a physics uh, question. Um, does the band gap of the modern material uh, makes a difference, uh, makes more impact to the decoherence time? For example, if you compare silicon, silicon, germanium, and then you compare gallium arsenide, or if you go to two, two, six structures, will those are those expected to give a better result? Um, I I don't I wouldn't think so. So the the band gap uh, does not uh, directly impact the coherence very much. Um, in these old gallium arsenide experiments, the limiting factor was really the the hyperfine interaction with the nuclear spins, and and then the nuclear spins are largely eliminated in these silicon twenty eight isotopically enriched materials. And at that point, um, the, the limiting mechanism in many of the experiments today actually is charge noise. And, and of course, charge noise does not directly affect spins, but indirectly it does, um, you know, uh, in two ways. Let me um, jump, for instance, to, to here, All right? So I, I ex explained briefly that the, um, qubit frequency for each of the six spins is different from each other because of the piece of cobalt micromagnet here. So that means that if you displace the electron from one quantum dot to the next, suddenly its frequency changes. It also means that if because of charge noise, the electron position is modulated in a noisy way within a single quantum dot, that also changes the qubit frequency in a noisy way and thus leads to decoherence. Um, and then a second way that charge noise couples into the spins is uh, here, right? So now we aim to control the overlap of two electron wave functions. That overlap gives us the two qubits interaction. If there is charge noise, that overlap also becomes noisy. We try to be um, somewhat insensitive to it by operating at this symmetry point, but we're not fully sensitive not fully insensitive to charge noise, also not at this point. So, so in practice, actually, charge noise limits a lot of the uh, experiments today. All right, thank you for the questions. Um, are there any other questions in the audience? Chris, if you want to come up and get mic'd up, that's great. There's one on the back there, yeah. Please come up to the microphone if you don't mind so everyone can hear you. We'll take one more live question here, leave in, and then move over to... Chris Monroe, are you, are you coming up with a question or not? Yeah, can you use a microphone, please? Thank you. I was just uh, curious um, if um, you think uh, you can implement the, the five qubit error correcting code or if, uh, you can you can take product of gates um, measure product of gates without measuring. Did you hear that? Leave in as a question of can you do a, a qubit error correction code on your six qubit device or a parity measurement, something of that nature? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, um, I I think that that you know that not, nothing uh, prevents us in principle from doing that. Uh, we have implemented um, you know pieces of it. For instance, we have implemented. The parity measurements, actually, they're part of our standard measurement protocol in this experiment. Furthermore, you know, we, we have uh, the ability to run controlled knot gates between all the neighbors. That is also part of air correction protocols. Um, if, you, if you want, of course, then also classical feedback can be part of air correction protocols. That's also something that we have done in this case for the state preparation. Although I should add that, that currently the, the, that feedback loop 
would be i think too slow to to go or to fit within the within a proper error correction uh, uh cycle um but but again that's that's also not not fundamental so so yes i think all the ingredients are there in principle and and so um there are no no obstacles of principle to to such uh experiments Thank you. Right. Thank you for the question. Uh, let's thank Professor Van der Seypen again. It's good to see you leaving. Hope to see you in person soon. Yeah, indeed. I certainly hope so. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So our next speaker up is Professor Chris Monroe. He's at Duke now, and I think uh, owns a square block pretty much. The new building's on. Is that close, Chris? But uh, Chris was a pioneer in the field and still is a pioneer, but was involved in some of the most early experiments on trapped ion systems and demonstration of quantum logic gates at NIST with, with David Weinland. It was back in the 90s, mid 90s, I think, and has really continued to push that field forward with shuttling of ions and multi-ion logic gates. Uh, Chris is a co-founder of IonQ and a technical director there, a big startup company on trapped ion systems. And the title of the talk today is Quantum Computing with Atoms. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jason. Good to see you again. Vanita, appreciate the invitation. This is very loud. I don't want people to fall asleep, but can you hear me? Okay. All right. On Zoom, good. All right. Uh, th thanks for the uh, intro, intro, Jason. This will be a little bit of a change of pace, I suppose. I, I am a hardware person. I'll be talking about a, um, uh, a different class of hardware to build quantum computers, but in the spirit of What's being set up here at URI, uh, what, I, what I love about this field is that I'm always a student and I was trained as an atomic physicist making atomic clocks. It seems pretty narrow. Um, but in the last 10 years or so, um, it's not that atomic physics is done, but I feel, that, uh, I feel that I'm more excited and learning a lot more about quantum algorithms, things that quantum computers can do. And what I also have learned is that um, in this, these early days of building these devices, we have to sort of tie together every part of what we call the quantum computer stack. And that means people that don't know any physics, they need to learn, learn a little bit about some of the native ways that we entangle qubits, whatever the hardware is. And for our part, uh, as the lowly physicists at the bottom, we need to really learn about what algorithms are and uh, what they need to look like so we can build the next generation of devices Shortcuts are the key here in these early stages. You know, in, in 20 or 30 years, we hope qubits will be like silicon transistors are now to classical computers where they're a commodity and you can be, you can take, you know, like we take photographs, 10 megabytes on our, on our phones because memory is cheap, it's a commodity. So you know, we're, we're waiting for that day. It's not here yet. However, there are hints that maybe, you know, the, the, the advent of quantum computing is sooner than you think. There, there may be ways to do things without full fault tolerance yet before we get to the commoditized qubits I, I was talking about. And I'll make the case uh, that, that I think trapped atomic ions are maybe one platform that might, might get there first, Probably, almost certainly won't be the last technology, but uh, they may be leading the way toward other technologies coming up. So as a student, we all learn about the application of quantum computing and the, the big one, of course, is Shor's algorithm for factoring large factoring numbers. Uh, and and we, 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 well, we tend to memorize small numbers to factor them like 100 is 10 times 10. But very big numbers, of course, every time you add a digit, it gets twice as hard. So you don't need too many digits before it becomes impossible. And, and uh, it's true that Shor's algorithm, you know, it would take maybe a few hours to really go top to bottom through it. But um, the, the math is actually not too hard. It's pretty beautiful, but here's my way of explaining Shor's algorithm. You start with a quantum computer that has at least, uh, if we're going to factor the number 39, for example, we only need six qubits because two to the sixth is 64, and that's enough. So you store a superposition of those first 39 numbers or maybe some more, and then you apply operations that allow these amplitudes to interfere. And bang, you get this at the end. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of a shortcut through the, the beautiful uh, structure of the Shor algorithm, but the point is the number of interferences you need to go from here to here uh, scales only polynomially with the size of the input, whereas classically, the best classical algorithm scales exponentially. So it's a change in complexity class for this problem. And the reason we love this problem is that 
in, in just a few lines, you can prove that a quantum computer is exponentially faster for something. It's sort of an existence proof. The bad news, I'll get to this later. The bad news is that uh, to factor an interesting number, we, you know, we need much bigger than numbers than 39, and we don't have machines that can touch that. But what I want to uh, contrast this application space with is the idea of using quantum computers for uh, something, you know, a, a very broad type of problem. I'll just call it an optimizer. And academics hate this area because these are heuristics. You, can, you, you can't really prove much about what a quantum computer can or cannot do in this space. Um, the good news is you might not need to have to prove things. That's what heuristics are. If, if something is useful, who cares if you can prove it or not? The factoring algorithm you can prove, and these, things, these applications in general, uh, all you need to do is show that it works better or more efficiently than any classical, any known classical device. It doesn't mean a classical device might not come around and beat the quantum computer, but it makes it useful. It adds value. And, you know, I, I do like to, uh, I get in a lot of trouble when I show this picture here, but probably one of the best known optimization problems in logistics is the traveling salesman problem. It's a combinatorial optimization problem, finding the shortest path between uh, and cities, visiting them each exactly once. Now, this is indeed an exponentially hard problem classically. It probably also is quantumly. Uh, I don't think anybody believes a quantum computer will solve the traveling salesman problem, but it may be able to get an approximation that's better than what we can do classically. That's, an, again, an idea of a heuristic. Uh, a, lot, a lot of research on, on that topic. Um, to me, Simulating physical systems and chemical systems is also an optimization of sort because the electrons on a big molecule, they optimize by themselves. Uh, the interactions between electrons, it turns out to be a related combinatorial optimization problem. You can think of it that way. And many feel that quantum computers will have their first impact in this direction. This, you know, even small molecules like caffeine, which has something like 100 electrons, it's not super easy to solve the structure of that molecule, much less, uh, you know, much bigger molecules. I think we'll hear more in the next, in the next few days about this application. Um, but I think one thing we can agree on is that quantum computers are not big data machines. It's not lots of data in, lots of data out. In fact, they're very small bandwidth machines and they're both, both their inputs and outputs. But of course they can sample huge configuration spaces and this is, it's not exactly big data because you're not inputting big data. What you're doing is you're being, in, in some sense, you're, you're testing all kinds of configurations of a complex model that, to, to, to optimize. And I, I like this article, it's a little dated. Uh, you can't see the year, this is, this is a couple of years ago, 2018, I think. And it was about the hype of AI and big data. And th these economists write that, that models are really, uh, that are informed by AI, and big data are really the, the uh, uh, what we need to run the world with. So I think uh, it, from a very high level, quantum computers will be approximating models, allowing us to optimize things. So my, I'm gonna now turn to hardware. I'm, I'm, I'm more sure footing there. Uh, my colleague, Bill Phillips at NIST and the University of Maryland is fond of saying that a quantum computer differs more than your laptop, then your laptop differs from an abacus. And this to me gets to education as well, because you know, these two, one's a very fast computer, the other is very slow, but they, they compute using the same principles of, of mathematics or physics, whatever you wanna call it. They're both Turing machines formally. Uh, so they, they follow the same model of computing uh, fundamentally down to bits or what have you and interactions between bits. But quantum computers are completely different. And you, I think you all know this, that quantum computers with their, qubits and their superpositions allow us to compute in a totally different way. And this is why you know, programs like, like the master's program here are so important because it's a cultural shift in the way we think about solving problems that's important. Not just from physicists building devices and engineers building devices, but people that want to solve problems. You're going you're, you're to have sociologists and economists needing to learn a little bit about quantum logic. I think that's really important. So it's, it's a very broad field and that's what makes it super exciting. So I think a corollary to this, this statement here is that on the experimental side, on the device side, why would we expect a quantum computer to look anything like the laptop? So we have uh, uh, many 
potential platforms for quantum computers. I stole this, most of this slide from a, you don't see the quote somewhere. I had it, that's on the, down on the bottom here. This is from a science magazine article that the editors wrote about quantum hardware. And there were several, several candidates. I had to add a few in, uh, in, the, in the last four or five years that have come up, but they naturally sort of break into two camps. I think we heard, heard some great work from Levin and also our, 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 our chairman of the session uh, leading uh, the charge on using uh, individual silicon spins. Superconductors are being industrially developed in, in a very big way. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about a different class of qubits that are natural qubits. They're, they're not man-made. They're fundamental particles in a way. I, I guess you, a physicist wouldn't call an atom a fundamental particle, but you don't have to manufacture it, okay? You need to isolate it, but it's sort of made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and, and, and you're done. So it has its own set of challenges that are largely complementary to man-made qubits. Um, now, while the qubits, I, I, I'll say the qubits are perfect, they can be perfect, and there's no exaggeration there because these are, we use atomic clocks as our qubits, so they're perfectly replicable. Um, uh, they don't really occur naturally isolated, so we need to, we need to control them, and that's the challenge. So I'm going to talk uh, a lot about uh, the, the trapped ion platform. And I would say trapped ions and superconductors are right now kind of leading the charge. It's certainly uh, within industry. And so as I talk for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to give a little bit of a, both of an academic uh, and industrial view of, of, of the state of the art in this field and maybe, maybe as a whole and, and you know, what we can learn from both sides. I think it's really important that we have both industry and academic endeavors in quantum. Uh, for reasons I'll, I'll, I'll certainly talk about. So this is a picture of an ion trap. The, the, uh, th this, this chunk that looks like a bow tie is actually made out of silicon. It has many layers and it's coated with gold. There's nothing quantum about this chip at all. It's at room temperature even. Uh, what's quantum, of course, is that the atoms that float above the surface here, this is a composite picture. Uh, this is about a centimeter on a side and the atoms occupy maybe these 80, 80 atoms occupy about a half a millimeter and they're a 10th of a millimeter above the surface. They're in a vacuum chamber. You don't see the chamber here, uh, but there's a small vacuum chamber around. There's no air. And so these things really, these atoms, the only thing they see uh, is each other. So they're nearly perfectly isolated. Now to, to, a, to a small degree, there are fluctuations in the surface noise and so forth, but that surface is 100 microns away, so it's really miles away, atomically speaking. And if we cool this chip to 4 Kelvin, 4 to 10 Kelvin, that noise pretty much goes away. But we don't necessarily have to, depending on the system. So I'm going to talk about a platform where this is the quantum computer. Each atom is a quantum bit. It stores uh, information in, a, in an effective spin. They're called hyperfine levels of the atoms. These are the same two levels that are used for atomic clocks. And we're going to exploit those advantages for, for qubits. The T1 and T2 lifetimes are essentially infinite. We don't, those are not going to be limits in any uh, uh, reasonably designed ion trap quantum computer. The limits will all be the control. How do we control them? Well, actually, why do we see them? We see them because we shine laser. In this picture, we're shining laser light that resonates with one of the qubit states to an excited state and it fluoresces strongly. Uh, and so we're gonna measure these things by shining laser light on them. And if they're bright, that's a one. If they're dark, that's a zero. We also shine light on them to execute quantum gates. And uh, that's afforded because these, these atoms, you might wonder, why are they fuzzballs? These are the diffraction limited spots due to our optics. There's, the atoms are separated by several microns, maybe four to six microns. And to execute quantum gates, we're going to, we're going to shine lasers uh, on them in just such a way that modulates their Coulomb uh, repulsion. These are ions, of course. Uh, and when you move one of them, they all know it. So here's, um, this is, there's a little bit of math here, but this is pretty much the only math slide. The idea is if we have a, a line of these, these atomic ions um, and we want to entangle, we want to do an, an AND gate or a controlled knot gate between any pair, we shine a laser beam on those two. And the laser beam is very special because it applies a force in such a way that's sometimes called an optical tweezer. Um, it, it can push or pull an atom depending on its state. If the qubit is in the state up, it moves up. If it's in the state down, it moves down. 
And the idea here is that if you, if you consider uh, this force on exactly two atoms, if they're both in the same state, they move the same direction. So their Coulomb interaction doesn't change. But if they're in different states, then they're a little bit further apart. They're on this triangle. And the, that modulation, that tiny modulation of the Coulomb energy is enough to give you a very strong interaction. Uh, in this regime, this is a simplified version. It's, it's basically a dipolar one over R cubed. In, in practice, it's not one over R cubed because um, <laughs> what I'm covering up is that all the other ions moved also. Uh, and by coupling to normal modes and doing appropriate laser pulse shaping, uh, we can make this a fully connected graph. We can do a gate between any pair, no matter where they are, as long as they're contributing in their same normal mode. So, so if you look at, um, from a logic point of view, if you look at the four possibilities of those two qubits, only those that have different qubit states will suffer a phase shift because they, their Coulomb energy changed. So this is a nonlinear gate because what happened to down up and up down, uh, when you multiply those two, that's not what you get when you apply something to up up. So that's a nonlinear gate. And by setting this phase to be pi over two, you get full entanglement essentially. Okay, so this is the gate we use. And uh, I, I mentioned, um, I'm making it simple to, just to explain it in one slide that, that we can couple between any pair. It's not really a dipole interaction here. The other uh, sleight of hand is that we do this in the X basis of the spin, just kind of technical. So this is basically our native gate. It's called an icing gate because the effective Hamiltonian is an icing coupling XX. It's not a C naught, it's an XX. So this is the native gate all ion trap quantum computers use. And all algorithmists should, if they're programming in gates, they should, they should know about this. So it's a very low level thing. Um, yeah, this, this idea is based on earlier theory by Sir Akinzoler in 95. Nobody uses that version of the gate, but it's been improved uh, by Molmer and Sorensen, and that's basically what I'm talking about here. So, so this is an animation of what a, what a trapped ion quantum computer looks like. So the first step is to um, initialize. So we have a space time diagram here, seven qubits going left to right in time. And the first thing we do, we initialize through optical pumping all the qubits to be in a particular state. And then we run the program, which is a series of gates, multi-qubit gates. That's a two qubit gate. You can see the ions move around. It's a single qubit gate. So we're basically sending, it's an optics experiment. We're sending laser beams across these atoms to execute a particular program. Um, you can do parallel gates. You can do four qubit gates and qubit gates. Most, we, we typically do dual qubit gates. And at the end of the day, to read out, we send it another laser similar to the initialization laser. And those that are glowing, that's one. Those that are dark, that's zero. And the fidelity of readout is better than we need. It's, uh, it can be better than five nines, and you don't need five nines unless you have 10,000 qubits. So once again, we don't worry about the initialization and measurement. So that's, that's sort of a, a very high level view of what a trapped ion quantum computer looks like. And unfortunately, this is sort of what it looks like at the laboratory level, or it did several years ago. This is uh, one of my laboratories at Maryland uh, about five or six years ago. Um, and if anybody that comes into that lab, they're going to say, okay, that's a cute experiment, but that's not a computer, certainly not a scalable system. And yeah, I don't blame them for thinking that. The atoms are actually, you know, obviously in a very tiny volume right here. You know, I, I can't even point to it, but look at all the wires and all the mirrors, all the optics and all the lasers. That scares anybody off. And rightly so. The, um, it, I love working on experiments like that um, because everything is totally flexible. Every mirror, we can move it in three dimensions, which is probably too much control. Somehow we rewind it all the way to the beginning. Oh, no, not this. There we go. Um, but if you know what you want to build, you can shrink things down. And the story over the last few years uh, is that pretty much everything you see here, except for the grad students, uh, is, is in this couple of meter cube box. I'm not sure why that keeps doing that. Now, the ability to do that requires some pretty serious engineering. Uh, but, but again, if you know what you want to do, you can freeze all these optical beam lines. It's not necessarily an experiment that you want to have flexibility with. This box, we don't open up but once every I don't know, four to six months. Everything we need to adjust is run autonomously through software. So part of, my, part of what we do in ion traps is try to throw everything up the stack. 
from atomic physics to control to optics, from optics to software, to software to algorithms, throw everything up the stack because we're pretty confident that the software part of the stack, you know, there's a lot of activity there. That's, I think that that's really growing. If we can just get the quantum physics out and up into the software, we're gonna be in good shape. Now, this, this apparatus was funded by a, a very large effort through IARPA, Logic Program, Logical Qubits Program. The idea there was to build a error-corrected single logical qubit, maybe two of them and a couple of them together. Well, we convinced IARPA that to do that, we needed a very highly performing quantum computer. And of course, we can do anything with that quantum computer. We can also build an error-corrected qubit. So it was a very nice program to help us build quantum computers in general. It afforded us the ability to work with Sandia, who I think I mentioned they built the chip. I maybe failed to do that. You know, Rick Miller spoke earlier today and his group, they have a very adept ion trap group in New Mexico, and they fielded the ion trap chips for us. The optical packages, a combination of L3 Harris, coherent, um, uh, AO sense, cold quanta helped us on some of the smaller vacuum systems. Uh, the NSF stack program also is underwriting the, you know, the ability to run algorithms of a scientific nature on this device. So this is really an engineering uh, effort, and it's a little um, rare to see something like this at a university, but we were sort of lucky to have an agency like IARPA that has their previous program, um, MQCO, that's a 10-year span that we could build up the engineering. So if you look inside the box, Again, it's, it's fancy optics, a lot of optics. We have a 32 qubit um, template. That's because we have 32 laser beams. We can expand that if we need to, but one of the, uh, one of the principles we've uh, thought long and hard about when it comes to scaling is that um, we shouldn't build too many qubits unless our qubits have a sufficiently high fidelity. And at the university, we were well, 99, 99 and a half percent fidelity. So, you don't need 32 qubits if that's all the fidelity you have. If you only have a fidelity of 99 and a half, that means you can do about 200 ops. That means you don't need any more than 20 qubits. If you have 200 qubits, it's no more powerful. You're limited by the fidelity. Of course, um, qubits are cheap in a way because they're just atoms and we know how to trap more of them. We can do that. We've, we've held many hundreds of atoms in these traps, but we don't control them because it would be silly because we don't have the fidelity to do that yet. And what limits the fidelity? Silly things like lasers flapping in the air. So you know, clearly we wanna to go toward more integrated optical solutions here. But again, this is, these are technologies that exist outside of quantum that will be folding into the system. Now, one thing we realized in this system, I kind of hinted at this earlier, I've spent most of my career down at the bottom here, playing around with individual atoms, learning how to perfect gates, stringing gates together, uh, the laser pulse shaping is another level uh, uh, of control. There's, there's nothing quantum about laser pulse shaping. There are electronic signals sent to modulators. Um, quantum compiler. Um, if you look in a textbook, you see CNOT gates, Hadamard gates. We don't have those. We have Ising gates and rotation gates. They're simply related, but when you convert from one to the other, there's huge opportunities for compiling and, and compressing any circuit. So this is a real black art. They're also run by heuristics where you compile or condense a, a complex quantum circuit to, to maybe condense your gate count by a factor of 10, depending on the system. And at the highest level, you have a user who knows nothing, certainly nothing about the atoms or maybe nothing about the lasers or nothing about the compiler. All they know is they wanna run an algorithm. So we, cert we got an appreciation that in the morning we would tune up the system and in the afternoon we would spend all our time up here on the phone or on, on the internet coupling to collaborators who would be wanting to run, uh, run routines and algorithms with us. And we started pretty early on, uh, almost 10 years ago, more in a quantum simulator system. The optics wasn't as fancy. We didn't have universal control, but we had some control over the system. Um, and and what's, what, what's been really fun is, again, the educational aspect of these things. A lot of these topics are fields that I knew nothing about beforehand kind of get up to speed. Oh, I want a, a, a typical collaborator would call and say, uh, we want to run this materials uh, simulation. I, I don't know what the material is or what it means or why it's important. But, you know, over the course of a year, or 18 months, they, they convince us and come up with circuits and we run them. Uh, the, the last year or two has been really busy. And I should note that um, I was blessed with lots of leadership in my group at Maryland, now at Duke. 
uh, Norbert Linke, Marco Satina, and Crystal Knoll in particular, and all three of them are uh, faculty at Duke now. Uh, also uh, Guido Pagano, who uh, just moved to Rice last year. Um, so so uh, ha having these leaders all kind of pick and choose the applications they want to run uh, was a lot of fun. So I want to give just a couple examples. <clears throat> um, one, this is a little early, but um, this is from uh, late 2017. It's studying a particular phase transition uh, that we that's predicted in magnetism. It's, it's not a phase transition in the usual sense because it's a dynamical phase transition. It doesn't involve equilibrium states. Uh, and, and to realize this, we have, we have a, a set of coupled spins. This is, an icing, this is an icing model, but it's fully connected. It has a long range interaction. Every spin has an icing interaction with every other spin. So even though it looks one dimensional, uh, it's, it's uh, more complicated than that. And we, we uh, compete with that interaction term uh, by adding a, an effective magnetic field. And because these two don't commute, there's a competition and you might expect a phase transition. Well, in this experiment, we prepare all the spins along the X direction. We, we turn, on this, uh, turn on this coupling, so the spins interact, and then we measure them, kind of a simple experiment. And the only variable here really is, well, the number of spins and the ratio of B and J. If B is really, really big, then all the spins will independently process around that magnetic field that's kind of boring, like a paramagnetic response. But if B is small compared to X, not zero, if it's zero, it's kind of trivial because the spins are already along X, so nothing really happens. But if there's a small Z compared to X, there's a very interesting competition here, and they may order along X more than process along Z. That's the phase transition. And to measure it, we... Um, you know, the simplest thing is just to look at the magnetization of the system. And for us, that's the total brightness of the atoms. We flood it with light and we measure which ones are bright, which ones are dark, count the total brightness. And here, as we vary B over J, we see uh, that magnetization, um, <laughs> it changes character. When B is small compared to J, not much happens because it's already, we're already in an X state. But when B is much bigger than J, we see that precession and it sort of washes out because there's a lot of frequencies going on here. Um, but there's quite different behavior there. I wouldn't call this a phase transition though. It seems like sort of a crossover between the two. So we looked at a, a, a more interesting variable, the two point correlator averaged over all pairs. Remember we're measuring every spin. We can measure any correlator you want, any n bit correlator even. But this is a sum of the two bit correlators now versus the number of spins. And we expect a dip uh, at, at some intermediate value of B over J, um, and even up to 53 spins or so, which is sort of testing the limits of our system, there is a dip, but it's not very sharp. Again, not in the infinite limit, we expect a logarithmic divergence here, but we don't, we can't really say we have evidence of that. However, we can measure any correlator. So we went on to measure an n body correlator. In this case, we measured the size of the largest domain. After we, after we turned on this, this uh, Hamiltonian for some amount of time. And then we averaged over many runs. It's important in every single run that we can measure every spin with nearly 100% fidelity though. And when we look at the, as we increase B over J, it's a little hard to see from this picture, but the, the average, the, the mean largest domain size, oops, sorry. Oops, there we go again. The mean uh, largest domain size went through a pretty sharp minimum. And I guess the point I wanna make is that we couldn't calculate where that minimum was gonna be. It depends critically on alpha, the, the, which is, I think it's 0.9 in this experiment. Um, I, I, I hesitate to call it quantum supremacy, just because we couldn't calculate it doesn't mean that somebody can. <laughs> but it was an experiment that, that really tested our, the, the limit of our, our ability to simulate what's going on. Now, so th this is a so-called quantum simulator, I might say, because it's not, we don't have full control of the system and we've, you know, over the last many years, especially with Alexei Gorshkov, our collaborator um, uh, at, at, at NIST and JQI and a series of other uh, mostly condensed matter theorists, we've been playing around with lots of models in this system. It's been a lot of fun, B big learning experience for all of us. I'm gonna maybe rush through, well, I have a few, I have a, I have a few minutes here. This is one of my favorite uh, applications where I had to come up to speed on something I knew nothing about. Um, and it has to do with uh, something called quantum scrambling, which is a property of a quantum process 
that is sort of like entanglement, but it's more, it's entanglement at all depths, as it turns out. And the reason it's interesting, especially to cosmologists, is that uh, it's, it's basic in the theory, the quantum theory of black holes. Uh, black holes are thought to scramble information really fast, let's put it that way. And you know, this, this uh, arose from collaborations with Benny Yoshida and Norman Yao, and also in the background, Lenny Susskind at Stanford. Uh, these, are, these are, especially uh, Lenny, he's a cosmologist who has kind of background interest in quantum information. And I would say maybe I'm the other way around. And the idea here is that we developed a circuit. Okay, you know, lower your sights, only seven qubits. The black holes are really small here. <laughs> but the, the idea is we, we, this circuit is a litmus test for a unitary, any unitary operation here, if it scrambles or not, we can tell. And you'll note we have to, we have to um, apply U and its inverse, U dagger. So uh, a circuit-based system might be uh, an interesting way to do this because we can develop circuits where we can simply apply the inverse circuit and so forth. Now these EPR gates are, they're basically icing gates that allow us to pairwise entangle. And what is the litmus test? Well, the litmus test is for any input here, it will appear on that seventh qubit rail if and only if you scrambles. Um, in, in, in the parlance of quantum computing, I hate to say it, but this is teleportation. The, the state of that first qubit is teleported to the seventh qubit, but only if you scrambles. So it's kind of a neat litmus test. It it's, uh, depends on the measurements of Bell measurements of these outputs. That's kind of a detail. Um, and uh, so, so we successfully applied this to the minimal case of a three qubit unitary. So that's the black hole, just three qubits. Um, a little goofy, and that's the inverse black hole. So, so again, this circuit is not easily scalable, um, but you know, Lenny tells me that if we can do this with 50 or 80 qubits, he said there's possible, it's possible there could be some interesting phase transition there because that's at the limit of where they can model what's going on with the scrambling. So here's the picture of a real pair of black holes and a, a wormhole that connects those black holes. And, there's this deep and amazing connection between entanglement between two black holes and uh, teleporting through a wormhole. I mean, I, I'm saying all these Star Trek type words, but um, uh, it, 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 the connection is really profound. Of course, it, it involves quantum and gravity. So this is a, a big deal. Um, so again, this to me, the, you know, it was, it was beautiful. I can run the circuit fine. I can test it. I can test all variations on it. But the interpretation in terms of cosmology is really cool. Um, on our, we, you know, we, we were performing for IARPA, I mentioned to do, uh, to do air correction. And with Ken Brown at Duke, he kind of pointed us to a very efficient um, air correcting code that only needs 13 to one overhead for one round of air correction. Basically you get to buy a nine in your fidelity by using this. So if you're at 99.9%, .9%, you can get to 99.99% with an overhead of 13 to one. Uh, and this bacon shore code uh, is remarkable because it's it, because the overhead's low and the threshold is not too bad, 99.9%. You have to be there for this to really work. Uh, in, in our experiment at the University of Maryland and now at Duke, um, we encoded, we measured all the, you gotta watch out there. We measured all the stabilizers and we even uh, did a single logical qubit rotation on the logical qubit. We didn't yet do two logical qubits because we only had 15. Uh, the, the, the zeroth and the 14th, sorry, the, the first and last were just, we didn't use them because you might notice in this real picture, they're a little further apart than all these others. So we use these as sort of dummy electrodes, if you want. And we use the central 13. And we only did one round of this because we don't have partial measurement yet, but that's coming along. So we were able to measure the stabilizers and show that this, that, that, that the, um, that the logical qubit uh, has cleaner properties compared to all of the operations that make it. And that's an element of fault tolerance that hadn't been observed. And so this actually just appeared, I don't have the reference, just appeared in Nature last week. Um, yeah, I, I have a few other apps I probably won't have time to talk about. With Peter Zoller and Mohammed Hafezi, we're, uh, we're testing different quantum computers without having a quantum channel to do full tomography between them, but by using randomized measurements and you can look, look in these references for that. Um, with David Hughes and Michael Goulins, who moved from Princeton to NIST, 
We're measuring a different type of a phase transition by inserting random measurements in our circuit and showing it's like a percolation transition where the more measurements you lose a quality of entanglement at the end. Um, and uh, I know Umesh will be speaking tonight. He might talk a little bit about classical certification of quantum computers, which, um, and we, we actually did two experiments in collaboration with Umesh and Norm on the one hand, and also Thomas uh, Vidik at Caltech, two different functions that are sort of one-way functions. Now, the, the Shor's factoring algorithm is a brilliant way to certify you have a quantum computer. If you feed me big numbers and I keep factoring them, I must have a quantum computer. That's the logic. Of course, uh, factoring is really hard. You need a huge quantum computer, but it turns out there are easier functions uh, that, that we can evaluate and do the same thing. This, this looks like Shor's algorithm if you're an expert. It's not a to the x mod n, it's x squared mod n. And you can't invert that function unless you can factor n. So it's easier, the, it's easier than Shor in a way. And we've sort of demonstrated baby versions of these two uh, these two protocols. I think Umesh will almost certainly talk about that tonight. And then finally, I wanna uh, mention that of course, uh, with the ability to build a system that has full stack capabilities, um, th this, this is probably better pursued or at least uh, in conjunction pursued at, in industry. And so my uh, uh, long colleague, long time colleague, Jung Sang Kim and I formed the company IonQ about five or six years ago. Um, again, th this is actually an ion Q ion trap. It's not made, made, made at Sandia. We farm it out to several MEMS boundaries and so forth. Um, and of course, we had some big news earlier this month. We're now a public company. You might say, well, isn't that crazy? A, a pure play quantum computing company is public. Well, a couple of reasons why we went this route. One is that um, with the 2 billion uh, market capitalization valuation, we now have a bank account that is about 700 million. So we can now execute on a roadmap that's challenging and expensive, but we don't have to worry about the expensive part anymore. Uh, and it doesn't rely on breakthroughs. We have engineering challenges ahead of us that are severe, they're huge, but we're very confident we're going to meet them because they involve optics, they involve miniaturizing a vacuum chamber, things like this. So. This, this is a, a fun picture. We actually rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange, and I didn't know this beforehand, but you get this big big, uh, big banner. I don't know what we're gonna do with that. We don't have any room to hang that uh, at, our, at our home base. Um, so this is an example of what we can do at INQ with our software. When we load ions in the ion trap, we do it one at a time from one side of the chip. We bring it one at a time and we attempt to load. Most, mostly we're successful from each load. This is real time. And when we get exactly 24 qubits, they're zigzagged right now. We, we straighten them out and then focus and they're ready to go. This is a room temperature system and this crystal will last for a good hour. And then uh, when it, a collision with the background vacuum happens, then we do this again. So every hour we lose a minute. So that's an example of what we can do there. Um, the system, th this is an interesting business decision. We've put, um, we've put a couple of our systems on the commoditized cloud servers at uh, AWS, uh, Azure, and now GCP. And the reason it's interesting is that these systems, they need to run nearly 24 seven. And if you have a system running 24 seven, you're not really improving it. And that's the business decision. Um, and we decided to do this. And I think it was a good decision, not just to get these devices in the hands of users. Um, and even though they're small devices, um, we learned how to automate. and. Uh, from data end of last year compared to end of, end of, end of last summer, you can see we, we went up to a duty cycle of 80% 24-7 in our systems. Um, what we're really proud of is that the time, you know, rebooting the system is down to, you know, only a couple of percent. Calibrations, I think you always want to calibrate some. It shouldn't be zero. It shouldn't be 99 either. So, you know, we're sort of being able to, to have that medium. So just doing this, it was a huge engineering challenge just to keep the system up that, that much. And remarkably, the system actually did improve a little bit over that time because we were better at calibrating. But our latest system always, we built five generations now and system five right now is not on the commoditized cloud because we're still improving it. And we're running algorithms with, with, uh, with private concerns in, in different application spaces. I am running out of time, um, but uh, I, I think some, th something was said in the last talk about 
chemistry applications, I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more about that. The one, the one point I wanna make here, this is actually data from a few years ago, very small computations, but I just want you to look at this table. This is the simulation of the ground state of water, water molecule. It's a pretty simple molecule, obviously, just 10 electrons. We know the ground state energy is minus 70 something Hartree's, I offset this uh, from, from the known value. And as we make a deeper circuit with more qubits, we expect to hit chemical accuracy, which is sort of like the thermal fluctuations in the ground state. Um, what, what I want you to pay attention to is as we add qubits and circuit complexity, the number of gates we thought we needed was getting pretty ridiculous. Well, if you only have 99%, you're not gonna be doing 700 gates. But we were able to compile it down to you know, a factor of five or six in savings because we have a, a very expressive set of gates. The icing gate, we can apply the icing gate, not just for a pi over two pulse, but we can do anything. And that expression allowed us to, to dramatically simplify the variational algorithm here. And that, that's, that was really the point. Uh, and again, we just kind of made some headway along here showing that, oh, geez, keep doing that. I'm gonna run through the last couple of slides. There's not much more to say, but I, I do wanna talk about um, a, a couple of apps that we've been partnering with other companies. Maybe uh, uh, our organizer and URI uh, grad, uh, Christopher Savoy, will talk a little bit about uh, generative quantum learning to generate handwriting digits. This is only eight qubits. So again, you can simulate all this stuff on a laptop, but the way it's solved is something that may create value when you have 200 qubits instead of just eight. So this is a collaboration with Zapata. And again, the, uh, the reference doesn't fit here. Um, with Fidelity, we've been working on uh, copulas, that is a correlated uh, uh, generation of multivariate distributed data. In this case, this is a model of two stocks that should be correlated, Apple and Microsoft over time. And generating from such a correlated multivariate random data set is actually tricky to do classically. Well, maybe not with two variables, but if you have 2000 variables, it is. This was a collaboration with uh, uh, the, the quant team at Fidelity. A similar one at Goldman involved um, amplitude estimation. Again, I'm supposed to be able to read these and copy them down and I'm running out of time and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of skip through them. But we're using our latest generation system to do baby problems that we're so confident when we scale up, we're gonna be able to create value when we apply these to the bigger system. That's sort of the, the roadmap. It's, it's sort of in contrast to say, doing an academic experiment on quantum supremacy, for instance. <laughs> okay, so this is an example of our latest architecture that's going to allow us to scale. Uh, this is a picture of exactly 16 qubits. We actually have 64, four sets of 16, and we're, this is a real video, real time of them being combined. Uh, and this shows us that we know how to uh, modularly add uh, groups of crystals. We don't have control of, of all 64 in this system, but you can kind of clearly see how this modular type architecture will allow us to do that in the future. Um, in the long run, we're going to scale by looking like a data center. Um, there is a very well-known protocol to use optical photons to link individual trapped ions. We did this, uh, we first did this a long time ago, over 10 years ago in an academic setting. Um, and it's a slow connection, but what's, what's very cool about this type of architecture where you could imagine the ion trap chip in each one of these racks uh, is, is uh, augmented by a N by N non-blocking optical switch. What that means, it's like the old telephone operator. It can, uh, depending on its configuration, match any input to any output. And this allows us to have full connectivity to scale. So this is something we're not deriving benefit from now. Yet, when we, but when we get bigger, we're going to get even more powerful, the system, because it's fully connected at scale. Now, the problem is this connection is slow. The inter-quantum processing unit speed is still lagging behind the intra-QPU speed. It's about a factor of 100 below it right now. But again, this, this has to do with light collection and technology that we're pretty confident we're going to be able to use all kinds of cool technologies in silicon uh, photonics and elsewhere. This is my co-founder, Jung Sang Kim, actually. He built the largest optical switch ever when he was at Bell Labs many years ago. And that's a commodity. That was 20 years ago. And you can, uh, you can buy these things now. Sorry. Um, uh, this is a thousand port switch. And, and now, nowadays we don't need a thousand ports, but you can buy these things. Now this was at Telecom Wavelengths and that's true, but 
you can buy these things in the visible and that will be useful for us. So um, I wanna conclude just by noting that um, I think in general, ion traps have this path to scale that you might not have imagined when you look at the lab, but we're making it small. Our latest uh, vacuum chamber is very small uh, and this can operate at room temperature. It's a tiny thing. Uh, eventually it'll be, most of it will be done on chip with photonics. Uh, this is a picture from Lincoln Labs and Jeremy Sage is now an INQ employee leading up that, that effort to integrate photonics and of course the kind of the data center view in the future. Um, and again, if you really wanna network these things together, you really have to think about size, weight and power and cost. And you know, our model of quantum computing should be one that you know, there will be tens of thousands of them, not just one like particle accelerator. So cooling a system to nearly zero degrees Kelvin, um, I think great research will happen there, but in terms of you know, scaling and building a commoditized quantum computer, you know, there has to be major breakthroughs in the way we cool these systems. Um, so you know, as, as you know, we're all trying to get more qubits and more stuff out of those qubits. And this is, you know, this is the factoring algorithm. You know, it's really far away. Ah, happened again, so sorry. I think that was my last slide anyway, but uh, we, we look toward this, you know, to finding some type of treasure here in the land of quantum advantage where you can't simulate. And again, it's not clear exactly where that will be and in what field we have to sort of build it, see what happens. And uh, I'll, I'll skip over this one and just say that as in the spirit of the URI center and the degree program, I think there's a huge role for research and universities and government labs to play because uh, this is a sort of a business slide. You've probably heard of the hype cycle of emerging technologies. You might argue that in quantum, we're, if we're not at the top here, we're rapidly approaching. There is a lot of hype in the field. Uh, let's not ignore this line over here that eventually catches up. And I think the scientific use cases for quantum will maybe allow us to bridge that trough of disillusionment. So it's really important that industry be uh, uh, mated with government uh, and, and uh, academic uh, uh, uses of quantum computing for scientific applications. Those will probably happen first. And uh, we're doing this at Duke, and this is the big building. Uh, it's an old tobacco warehouse in downtown Durham where we're setting up our, our, our center. Um, and I think, um, you know, I'm delighted that, that you know, URI is taking the step uh, we need, we need a workforce to do this. It's somewhere between a conventional university and industry uh, for the coming decades. And uh, it's very exciting, of course. So thanks. All right. Thank you, Chris. Let's take a question or two. Chris, maybe you could comment on speed a little bit. The one slide you're sort of you know comparing the intra versus intra module speed of this optical interconnect and the, the gate speed is what uh, thousand hertz ten thousand hertz but at what point does that catch up to you compared to other technologies? Yeah, even the uh, e even the speed between yeah it was also obscurely written on an earlier slide um, this icing gate that's sort of the native gate um, it's typically microseconds, mm -hmm. ten, you know, tens of microseconds duration. So the clock speed's 10 kilohertz. So, so yeah, no, no, nobody likes a clock speed of 10 kilohertz. Um, but once again, one thing, uh, two things to say. We, we have run gates at lower fidelity that are much faster on the order of megahertz, but you know, the, we'll be able to push that to some extent. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's an interesting point. If you need to do you know, a trillion ops, and it's 10 microseconds, no matter what it is, you know, you're, you're kind of lost. The one thing I will say though, in the ion trap uh, architecture is we have full connectivity, number one, and we have pretty low error correction overhead. These are architectural advantages that haven't played out yet. They haven't even been a part of anything yet, but uh, to scale, I think those, those factors will help big, I think to, to, uh, to, to uh, reduce the time to solution, not the component time. But you're absolutely right. I think that the solid state systems sort of have natively really fast components. Uh, I, I think you know, five or 10 years ago, people would argue there should be some hybrid where you do both and we'll see. I think photons might be a way to connect the two systems, but um, I also think that the, to say one, one final nice thing, I think that all these hardwares may find their own application spaces. Mm -hmm. Those that you need to average, if you need to run a, the same computation 1 billion times, 
That's probably not going to want to do it with an ion trap. Uh, but if you need to run a deep algorithm, maybe a hundred times, maybe that's where the ion trap plays. So, okay. anyway. yeah. Thanks for that. Any other questions? Yeah, could you come up, please? Uh, we'll try to keep it short, okay? We're up against a break here, and then we'll have two more speakers. I have rather technical questions. If you can flip to your slides, your slide, I think. Okay. With the, with the experimental setup. Boost optic modulators. Oh, really? Okay. Almost there. Here? Yeah, so a few questions. What is actually happening? So this is pump and probe experiment. Is that right? You well, pump, you a, prepare states, and yeah, then... Yeah, you prepare, but that's at the beginning. Yes. And let's go to the end. And then you measure at the end. I don't even show those lasers. Those are separate lasers. This is all about the circuit itself, in between the initialization, but before the readout. All these laser beams will allow you by turning on individual pairs, you can do it any gate you want. Sorry, any, any gate you want between any pair. So this is where the quantum computation happens. There are other lasers that initialize and measure. But how do you prepare the states? Are you sending like pi pulse, pi or two pulse? Is that right? No, preparing the state is something called optical pumping. It's like a cooling, but it's a cooling of spins. It's pretty well known. Okay. You basically shine a laser on it, yeah. right? It's like link transition. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like pulse laser. Is it, is it pulse laser? Um, well, what is it? everything's a pulse laser. You turn it on and then off. But uh, no. But it's rather long pulse. It's yeah, it takes, it takes a few microseconds to initialize, uh, maybe a few hundred microseconds to measure. But those, there's no marginal cost to those. Th those are easy. This, I, I, draw, I concentrate so on the gates. Acoustic optic modulator is needed just to turn on and turn off yeah. one yep. of the beamlets. This is our controller. One of the beamlets, okay. It's the gate, the coherent part, the important part of the quantum computation. The, the initialization and the measurement, I sort of swept under the rug and, and then and then you measure uh total and then you measure absorption for each individual no fluorescence fluorescence okay yep what is the integration time for measuring uh, fluorescence? a few hundred microseconds few hundred. if it's okay maybe we could continue the technical discussion offline because uh, we're up against the break there's one question there chris from ryan mcguire on the screen uh to your left if maybe you could just address oh, that. okay so ryan McGuire which has... do you foresee happening first miniaturization or teleportation and guesstimate of public use. Um, yeah, I think I commented that teleportation is a weird term, but every time you run a gate, you call it your, your, you're doing teleportation. So, um, so I would interpret that as being, I mean, teleportation has been done in many platforms. If you do a gate, you, you're able to do teleportation. However, I think what you're saying is, are you able to do a gate between really distant qubits? Um, well, we did that with optical photons on about 10 years ago. The rate was very low. But the two ion traps were in separate vacuum chambers, separated by about a meter. Miniaturization, well, we're continually miniaturizing. You might argue you don't need to miniaturize. If it works, who cares how big it is? Um, but we, we think we do need to miniaturize in order to have this sort of data center model. So that's a continual process. Um, guesstimate of public use. Um, well, we're not yet beating classical computers, as you know. <laughs> So uh, I, th I think we're still sort of pre-threshold, but I think when we are able to scale to maybe 100 qubits with, I was just talking to Jake over lunch, 100 qubits and 50,000 ops, that's a pretty interesting place to be in. The public will be very interested because they won't be able to, in general, simulate what's going on on a classical computer. That doesn't mean, that's not a guarantee that you're gonna you know, create a huge industry, um, but you, uh, you know, I think it's gonna be interesting. It'd probably be scientifically first, the public use, we'll do, use it for scientific uses, and then we'll find commercial value. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Chris. We're out of time. Nita, unless you stay otherwise, we'll stay on schedule. We'll come back in five minutes. Does that sound good? All right. So feel free to get up, stretch your legs, and we'll be back here five minutes. We'll be super They all have the same vision, so it's good. It's rare that you get a big university. <laughs>
James, are we wrapping? Uh, not yet. Okay. I see you. I see you're on there. I'll be back in a few minutes and we'll check everything out. Okay. So let's Hi, Sue. Jason Petta here. How are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm trying. I was trying to do it off an iPad, and I'm all confused. So this is this is work. This is just a window on yeah, my laptop. See your full screen there, and your little mouse pointer is in the upper right corner. Yeah. Oh, can you see? I'm trying to move it. Does it? Does it move? Yeah, it's moving. Oh wow. Okay, great. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks. You in Sydney? Right. What's going on? Uh, yeah. No, I'm in Sydney. They may let us out someday. <laughs> it's yeah, you know, we're sort you know we are just sort of stuck here for a while. Yeah. Um, but okay. uh, like next month we may be able to leave, which is exciting. Okay. Yeah, we ran a little over on the last session, so we'll probably start in I'd say two three minutes. Let people. Oh no, up. it's it's absolutely fine. It's just bad if I was late. You understand. Yep. Okay. All right. Anyway, I'll be here. I'm gonna mute, but you know, I can't yeah. listen. All right. Jeremy Levy says hi. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> hi. You can't I'm really show up by January. Well, well, I'm hopeful. I was like, I was just been hanging in there, and then suddenly it looks like it may be possible. But now the big problem is at UNSW, and I'm trying to work on you know because they had this where like they were not letting any employees out. But I think I think it'll. I'm optimistic that I will make it, so. Fingers crossed. Susan, yes. your presentation and your audio look good on screen, so should be ready to go. Oh, great. Great. Benita, did you want to introduce the session or should I get it started? Okay. 
let's go ahead and, and restart here. It's a great pleasure to introduce Sue Coppersmith, who was at Wisconsin, is now in Sydney. Uh, it's been sort of a superposition state between the two places. I think it's collapsed and uh, you're now down in Australia. But Sue's been doing some great work along with the Wisconsin team on developing semiconductor quantum devices in the Silicon, Silicon Germanium platform. Probably one of the first groups really you know, pushing hard on that area for a long time and, and making a lot of progress. But one of their big areas now, I'd say, is the development of, of hybrid qubits where they try to operate in multi-electron regime and take advantage of flat bands that lend themselves to long coherence times. Another area of research, and I believe we're gonna hear about today in this talk, is uh, addressing uh, the valley splitting problem in silicon, silicon germanium, but the bulk band structure of silicon has a six-fold valley degeneracy. It's another degree of freedom that we potentially have to worry about. And uh, Wisconsin group has come up with some clever ideas to engineer the header structures and the growth profile to really push those valley splitting numbers up into a range where hopefully we won't have to worry about them much longer as a community. Uh, but uh, Sue's been very productive over her career as a recipient of many awards, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Association of Arts and Sciences, and is also a, a national academy member. So let's give Sue a well, warm welcome. Thanks. Well, thank you. And um, I thank you. I want to thank Sue Vanita for um, organizing the conference. And uh, um, and it's a little early here, but it's been real. you know, the talks, I, I woke up and I heard two of the talks and, and it, really great to see, um, you know, just all the progress that is, um, uh, that's going on and continues to go on. It's just incredible. Um, so yeah, I'm at the University of New South Wales, but um, all the work I'm gonna tell you about today was done in collaboration uh, with the group at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, and Mark Erickson will be uh, talking uh, later. And so you'll get a, a more experiment uh, from Mark. And, uh, but but it is true. This talk is about the valley splitting problem. Oh, and I did want to say I, I um, uh, I'm one of the people who actually benefited. I shouldn't. Want, I don't want to say benefit, but the pan because of the pandemic. Actually, I just had to wake up early, but we were able to continue to collaborate, and I'm, I'm really fortunate and uh, to be able to uh, uh, to have that opportunity. And the work I'm going to tell you about was done by quite a few people, and. Uh, Main, the main people are uh, in yellow here, and I have a few pictures of people. Um, but then also some of the work uh, was done in collaboration with, with some other groups, in particular, uh, Giordano and Scapucci to Delft did some experiments that I'm gonna show you uh, some results of later. Um, but let me first tell you a little bit of background. Um, so uh, since Levin has already given his talk, um, uh, I don't have to go into uh, a lot of detail about like why silicon, silicon germanium uh, heterostructures are interesting because all of the results, I assume all of the results he showed you were, were obtained in, in heterostructures of that type. All right. And so, so the idea of it, then again, this is sort of a, a, a schematic based from uh, Lassa Di Vincenzo from back in the day. But, but you have, again, metal gates, and then, uh, and then and you use those to apply uh, voltages to a heterostructure. And then the electrons live in this uh, very thin layer of silicon that is uh, surrounded by silicon germanium. And, uh, and they work just like uh, I, you know, MOS, MOS transistors that are in your phone. Um, but, but there's this uh, sort of buffer layer of silicon germanium that um, sort of shields the electrons from, um, from, uh, from bad effects of the oxide. And uh, so that's, uh, the, and that is a leading technology. Oh, I, oh, and I meant to put it on the slide. So, right, and so the, the results that Levin showed you hopefully convince you that this is a really promising technology. So I took out all the slides about what the recent progress um, because I think you, it's really impressive what he's been able to achieve, and then uh, other groups also. So this is a you know a very important technology for trying to make uh, quantum dot qubits in silicon. Um, so I wanted to contrast just a little bit about uh, the silicon germanium versus the silicon, and um, Andrea will be giving a talk uh, on um, 
uh, donor qubits in silicon, and he uses uh, this MOS te uh, technology. But in terms of a direct comparison, uh, it's mostly dire uh, directly com comparable to Andrew Zurak, uh, Andrew Zurak's work, where he makes quantum dot qubits using MOS, which is metal oxide um, semiconductor, semiconductor being silicon. And so these arrows here are the uh, supposed to be the electrons. And the point is they live very close to the oxide interface. And in silicon germanium, heterostructures, what you do is you have a layer of silicon germanium in between. And this, this, this interface between the silicon and silicon germanium is, a very, is an epitaxial, very nice interface. And uh, so the advantage is that you're just farther away from the oxide. And the rule of thumb is the oxide is more prone to disorder and charge traps and whatnot than uh, the silicon itself. And so just by moving the electrons away, you in improve the quality um, of, of, of conduction, certainly, but, you know, in principle, it, it just makes everything better, um, you know, more scalable, less prone to, um, uh, less prone to a problem due to a defect at the, at the interface. So, so that's the advantage of silicon, silicon germanium. And as, uh, as Jason said, Mark Erickson was really um, a leader or maybe even the leader in at the very beginning demonstrating that this was a, um, a viable material system for qubits. The disadvantage of silicon, silicon germanium is that it has a smaller uh, valley splitting. And, um, and actually at the very beginning, that was why Bark had the field to himself because people say, well, you'll be, you know, the valley splitting will screw you more or less. And, uh, and, and as you can see, because of what Levin said, um, that, that has not stopped incredible progress in the field because some, the valley splitting is not always too small, but it's still not at the point where it is reliably in a range, which is uh, suitable for, um, making qubits, high fidelity qubits. And that's what this talk is about, is, is, is addressing this problem. The first step of being, of course, to tell you what the valley splitting is. So, um, uh, uh, and so, and I'm very excited about this work and probably I should have done something which was more of a, oh, here's an overview, but um, we've made, I think, some significant progress recently, and I wanted to like to say, oh, look, we've, we've been worrying about this problem for years, and, and, and we have something that we may actually solve it. And um, so that's what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, so, so I'm going to tell you what, what value splitting is, and I know it's a technical term, but it's pretty easy to understand. And, it, and the, the, you'll learn a little bit about silicon, which, you know, you can always useful non-technical context, I'm sure, constantly. Um, and then in terms of the new result, which we're very excited about, is that we think we know how to really make the valley splitting big. And that is instead of, oh, we can go back, uh, instead of making this, this well pure silicon, make it silicon, silicon germanium. Not as much germanium as in these barriers, but add germanium to the well. And, we, and then I'm, hopefully we'll convince you that that, that that will increase the valley splitting by a lot. Um, another thing, uh, some recent work that we've done, which I think it could be really interesting and important is that by really sort of going to town on valley splitting, we think that we have a way now of actually probing the buried interface. So again, going back, um, you, you know, this is an interface that you can't really access in the normal way of like doing scattering. That's sort of a typical way of, 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 of characterizing interfaces that you, you maybe do an STM, uh, scanning tunneling microscope or doing some sort of scattering experiment. But if you're, if you're, if you're trying to do a buried interface, those, those techniques aren't really accessible on the atomic scale in real space. But actually we can use the valley splitting to be able to, um, take a quantum dot, move it around by changing gate voltages, and then you can actually locate the interface. So um, this is a talk where I, I can end on time pretty well and because I can just uh, tell you more or less about that. Uh, but again, the idea of each one is quite simple. So I, I uh, think both of these things could be really useful in the future. Um, okay, so finally, I'm gonna tell you what valley splitting is. So what the valley is, is it's, it's called a conduction band valley. And it's, this is the band structure of silicon. So again, if you have carriers in silicon, 
um, you know, as a function of, of, of crystal momentum, that the 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 conduct the 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 states have have energies, okay? And we're used to just thinking about energies that are like k squared, h bar squared, k squared divided by two m. But um, in silicon, what happens is that the minimum is not at zero. Zero is, is, is it's called the ga gamma is zero, all right? But that's not where the, uh, and, oh, and this is the conduction band here, this guy here. And uh, gamma is, is, is a maximum, it's not a minimum. The minimum is at this point here, which is the value minimum. And because silicon is a cubic crystal, there are six value minimum. All right. Now, in the heterostructure, it's under tensile strain and uh, in the plane. And so it turns out that there are only two value minimum, but there are still two lowest energy states. Like, you know, so th this is the K and minus K are the two states uh, where the um, uh, where the carrier energies are minimized and they're degenerate because of crystals, uh, because of the crystal symmetry. So. Um, if you have two states with the same energy, then that's sort of bad for quantum information because you know you you really want to have the all the quantum information in the spin degree of freedom, more or less. I mean, certainly in the qubits that Levin was talking about, that 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 that's sort of the idea is that you don't want to have to worry about the valleys. Um, so here's a schematic, and, and I think for purposes of this talk, this is really all you need to know is that again, what you have these wiggles because again, the band minimum is, is not at zero, it's at this very fast wave vector. And, uh, and then you have the plus and the minus, and those turn into the plus K and minus K, and they turn into sines and cosines. And so that's why these things are out of phase. And so there's, there's this potential due to the quantum well, all right? Again, the silicon germanium, and then with the silicon in the middle, and then there's an electric field which is used to, you know, get the electron in there. And so the wave function lo looks sort of like this. And there are two states that are out of phase: one's a sine, one's a cosine, roughly speaking. And the energy difference between those phase uh, between those two states is the valley splitting because they're two states because you have two valleys. And, uh, and, and and they're not the same though, because you can see they whether you smash the, as I've drawn it, you smash this up into the interface, and 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 sort of the wave function sort of hits the barrier at slightly different you know points in the phase, you know points in the oscillation, and so they have different energies. That's due to the fact that the wave function is uh, you know uh, getting pushed into the barrier. So from the confinement, you do have a volley splitting and that and so therefore people have been perfectly able to make qubits as you saw because Levin showed you you know you know beautiful beautiful qubits with with high yield that being said um uh on a wafer he showed you a wafer with um you know very high yield of qubits but but the valley splitting itself is um not so not under control yet and again that's that's why I'm excited to tell you about it um, so, so as a rule of thumb, uh, sort of a hundred microvolts uh, energy is a uh, um, is a rule of thumb of like that's you need more than that for the valley splitting. And again, for many applications, more is better. And so, for purposes of this talk, I'm just going to say, can we get the valley splitting more than hundred microvolts? So, so this uh, th these data that I'm showing you are measurements um, from HRL, and uh, each uh, color is. Uh, a different uh, heterostructure, and you can see, you know, varies from heterostructure, and um, and this is theory, okay. And it's plotted versus well width, okay, uh, with the width of the quantum well. I, I may come back to that later. Um, I we don't think that's actually what's causing uh, the trends that you see, but hopefully by the end you'll see what we think. And then what they did is they said, oh, look, if you have a, sh then they looked at it uh, again using our, you know present understanding as, as a function of the sharpness of that interface. So again, you're smashing those two wave functions into the barrier and, and they're noticing they're different. And the sharper you make the interface, um, it, the valley splitting should go up. But, um, but you can see actually like the variability at the small well widths is the most noticeable thing. Okay, and, and again, we call this good agreement in theory, but I would argue that it's, uh, you know, if you wanna say, look, we wanna, we wanna be up here, can we reliably get up there? We don't know how to reliably get up there. 
right? Because uh, here you have where you would think it's high and there's quite a lot of low value splitting there. Again, low meaning less than 100 microvolts for purposes of this talk. So, um, and, and this was published this year and, uh, and, and clearly uh, we're, we don't have that kind of control that we wish we had. So uh, what I'm gonna tell you about today is uh, the work we were doing where we're gonna, or, or I'm gonna hopefully convince you that uh, the trick is to put your medium in the quantum well. So that's, that's the message of uh, this part of the talk. All right, so, um, and actually the, there were two things that we did um, putting germanium in the well. And, uh, um, uh, and again, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. They're both manuscripts that I was sure would be submitted by now, but they'll be coming up on the, we'll be posting them um, hopefully within the next week or two, um, uh, two separate things. The first one, which is uh, we, we um, uh, is to put germanium in the well. And, and this was actually Bob Joint's idea is that, that if you put it with the right periodicity, you should be able to get the value splitting to go up. Um, but then in the course of understanding the experiments that were done, which I will show you about the wickle well, um, it turns out that you also can make, you can get value splitting to go up by just putting germanium in the well. And, and it actually doesn't need to be engineered. Um, random fluctuations will cause the value splitting to go up by quite a lot. Um, it doesn't go up 100% of the time, but it turns out moving the dot around a little bit, you can basically always find a region of high value splitting. And so we think that this is actually gonna be really key in terms of being able to, you know, just remove value splitting as a, as a major problem moving forward. We, we think this is, we're very excited about this. Okay, so, um, uh, so here's the theory of the wiggle well. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you about the, all the details, but, but just a picture of, the, of what's going on, again, is that what I had before is that this was silicon germanium, silicon, and uh, sorry, silicon germanium, silicon germanium, and then the well was silicon. But now the well itself is modulated. So this is like a concentration of germanium as a function of position. And it's modulated at a particular wave vector. Okay, and that wave vector is basically set by where that value minimum was. Okay, so you do it specially to sort of connect up, you know, k vectors where the value minima are. And so if, if your wave vector is like the right wave vector, you can get a really large value splitting. So again, just to set the scene, I forgot to put the line here, but, but 100 is here, 100 microvolts is down here. And so again, if you hit like this Q, you should be able to get a really big value splitting. And, uh, and, uh, and so basically uh, uh, Don Savage at Wisconsin made a well like that, okay? And so here is, uh, here's his well. It's, it's quite a thick well, but it doesn't actually matter that much how thick the well is because uh, you know, the electrons get pushed up to the top surface. And you can definitely see like a, a very well-defined period. Okay, and then here's a picture of the device, and here's a picture of. Um, I'm sorry, it, this is a graph of data uh, of value splitting from this from this device, and uh, uh, and you can see that most of the points are above 100 um, 100 microvolts, and so there's some you know evidence that putting germanium in the well is uh, is a good thing. Now there's this one. There is a low point here, first of all, and second of all, these points are not different devices. These points are the same device at different gate voltages. And so here's, this is sort of, these are gates, uh, you know, these are gates here. Um, uh, these are the screening gates. So these is S1 and S2. And basically by uh, changing the, the voltage difference between S1 and S2, what you're doing is you're moving the dots up and, up and down vertically on this, on this diagram. And, uh, and what you see is that the value splitting depends on S1 and S2, the difference, it, which is sort of telling you where the dot is. And so what we're finding is that the value splitting um, uh, depends on exactly where the dot is. Okay. So that leads you to, to say, well, what's causing that? Because this, the, the theory doesn't care where the dot is in the XY plane, this theory. And, um, so Merritt Lozer, who's a, who's a graduate student in Wisconsin, 
realize that we actually could calculate this. And, uh, and he used the effective mass theory that Mark, Mark, three, Mark Friesen cooked up in, uh, you know, sort of, you know, a long time ago. And he, he, again, I wish I had thought of this because this was, you know, obvious, but he said, well, but what happens is that the valley splitting basically is just, it's a contribution of a sum of the wave function with, with this exponential factor due to the oscillations in the, in the wave function. Um, that's just the sum over what happens over every atom. Okay, and if you change silicon to germanium, then you know, the sum changes. And there are these phase factors, but the fact is you're just adding up a bunch of numbers and that's subject to square root of n fluctuation. So, so, the, so just the formula that we've been writing down for years of, of what the value splitting is, is a sum over a bunch of atoms. And if the, you have statistical fluctuations in the atoms, it's reflected in the sum. And, um, and, then, and so he did a bunch of simplifications in order to calculate things analytically, but we've gone back and we've compared the results of uh, the simplified theory that he did with some you know, uh, reliable um, atomistic simulations that are you know, fit to a lot of data and, and have, are, have been shown to agree very well with a, a big mass of data. So, um, and so basically this is, this is what happens. So what happens here is that this is, um, uh, this is theory and experiment um, uh, obtained on, on just regular um, silicon, silicon germanium wells. Um, so again, this data inspired the theory. Okay, so there's no extra germanium in the well, but we're just looking at um, quantum wells a normal ones where, you know, just you have a silicon, silicon germanium, um, uh, silicon germanium, silicon, silicon germanium, but atom by atom, they've been characterized using atom probe tomography. Uh, this, this project was led by Giordano Scapucci, uh, actually. And so he, uh, his group grew the samples and then um, atom probe tomography was done. And then they went and, and measured the valley splitting and they did a lot of, of samples. And what, that, that's what this is. You see, and here again, you see a range of valley splittings. These are two different quantum wells, okay? More or less the same range. And you see that, you know, you, you get with pretty high, probability uh, value splittings of 100 microvolts or more, but, but you know, it's not, not all of them, gee, wouldn't it be nice to be more, okay? So you, this is a range that was measured experiment and that experimentally, and then Mayer did um, th the theory that I very briefly described to you, uh, gives you this kind of distribution and you see it gives, you know, really very, um, very similar widths and, um, uh, 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 you know, and, and, and very similar means. And, 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 and so, so the theory and the experiment agree quite well in this case. All right. So, um, but then again, what Merritt realized was that once you, once you have this kind of picture where, where the fluctuations in the germanium con concentration are what, what are leading to uh, the, the valley splitting, um, then you say, well, how do we make those fluctuations go up? And the point is, if, you, if, if, the, if the well is silicon, then, you know, if it's 100% silicon, then there's no concentration fluctuations because it's just 100% silicon. But if you have um, sort of 50%, then, you know, you have square root of N fluctuations, all right? And so, therefore, if you want the fluctuations to go up, you actually just want more germanium in the well. So, um, and so here again is like, this is a, the concentration of, of germanium as a function of position. So again, silicon germanium, silicon, silicon germanium, and you want the fluctuations here to go up, you say, well, let's just add a little bit of germanium to the well and see what happens. And this is what happens, all right? So, so what this is, uh, is a plot of, again, the valley splitting. And um, now you're supposed to notice the scale here. This is not 100 microvolts, this is 1,000 microvolts. So, so the 100 microvolts I've been uh, focusing on is down here at this white dashed line. And again, with 0% germanium concentration in the well, um, you see that basically your average valley splitting is, you know, more or less 100 microvolts, which is, you know, would be fine if they were all like that, but half of them are worse than average. But now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to vary two things on this graph. One is the germanium concentration. And I should say, like, you obviously, you, you know, in real life, you want to work down here because when you get to high 
uh, germanium concentrations and the barriers, you have to increase the germanium in the barriers also, and then you run into materials problems. So you want to work at, at low concentrations, but, but nonetheless, even at like 10% concentration, the scale of the valley splitting is much, much higher than at 0%, so, uh, 0 germanium. And now again, now what I want to do is compare to brand, brand X. The other thing that we looked at, uh, that people have looked at, you know, consistently is the interface with, and uh, again, this is characterized using the atom probe tomography. And what you see is that in, uh, decreasing the interface width doesn't help you nearly as much as putting germanium in the well until you get to really sharp interfaces and really small amounts of germanium in the well. So it's, it's a more reliable way of doing it. And also in practice, um, these are theory curves and achieving one monolayer uh, interface width is, 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 is very, very difficult. And, and currently, you know, so a five monolayer interface width is really much more, um, uh, much more achievable. And it's what people do achieve. And so basically, um, then basically, so it's these pink line, uh, sorry, the pink points. And you can see for the pink points, you're much better off putting um, germanium in the well. It really, it really helps the value splitting a lot. So um, again, we're, got, we're hoping to post this quite soon. I will say that the, um, the, this, is, this is a theoretical prediction based on the, uh, the experimental results for 0% um, germanium in the well, but we're, we're very excited. And we, 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 think, we think that again, increasing the value splitting scale to be this large in a reliable way, I think will just make a much more, um, uh, make silicon germanium much more reliable um, and, and uh, make the scaling up even more uh, e e easier than it is now, because again, we think that this may actually solve the problem. Um, so again, the summary of the first part is um, add germanium to your quantum well. And again, you can't add too much, but a little helps a lot. Okay. So uh, the second part of my talk, uh, I'm going to talk, uh, it, it's going to, it followed from the same work but uh, it's gonna address a different question. So now what I'm gonna do is, is talk much more about um, using the properties of the quantum bonds to figure out what's going on in the interface and, um, uh, and to actually be able to figure out what's happening in the growth and, and if you have intersteps, phase steps where they are. Ugh, sorry, I have to... I have to turn this off, sorry. Uh, it's a junk call too. There, sorry. All right. So, um, okay. Uh, so it's, so what, what this is, is I'm gonna talk about the, um, uh, the difference between the valley splitting and the singlet triplet splitting. And this, is something that in, in practice is, is, is uh, not thought about very much. And there's good reasons for that, but we ended up thinking about it and we think that's interesting stuff has happened. So um, the, uh, uh, so first I have to tell you the difference. Okay, so, so basically what we have is a quantum dot, here's a picture. And, uh, and these are the single particle levels, right? And again, in our silicon dots, the, uh, uh, the lowest energy state is this valley excitation I've been talking about all this time. And the, uh, uh, um, uh, so, so this is the ground state and then this is that valley excited state. Okay, and that energy is, you know, for, in, for purposes of this it, with our regular um, uh, silicon quantum well, this is like that hundred microvolts. But now we're gonna ask a different question, which is let's add an electron to the dot and figure out like what the energy is between the two electron states where one of the electrons is in the ground state, but the other one is in the ground state with the opposite spin or it, the same spin, but with the, um, uh, in the valley excited state. Okay, so, so if the electrons weren't interacting, these two states are exactly the same. Okay, the, the, the difference between the energy of the triplet and the singlet would just be this valley splitting. Okay, and so actually when people measure valley splitting, often they measure the singlet triplet splitting um, because it's easier to measure than the valley splitting in some ways. All right, however, there's an additional thing which is that there are also Coulomb interactions 
um, between these two electrons. And, um, uh, and so you might think that, you know, that could be important, but it turns out that if you have a valley state, um, uh, often, the, um, uh, the Coulomb interactions have very small effect. They just don't contribute very much. So when people do these measurements, they sort of tend to measure the single triplet splitting and they call that the valley splitting. And in fact, all the data I showed you up till now, I mean, I was taking things from papers and people call it valley splitting, but they were actually single triplet splittings. And so it's sort of assuming the effects of Coulomb interactions are small. Um, but, but, but J.P. Dodson actually went and checked this. And again, from the point of view of theory, which I'll show you in, in a minute, I mean, you know, we said, oh, if it's a valley state, the, the uh, interaction effects are small. These should be the same. Um, but, but here you see that this is a valley splitting, single particle splitting is the valley splitting, and here's a single triplet splitting. And, and they're actually quite a bit different. And, um, and here's the ratio of the two, and it's a systematic variation as you go across here. And so that leads to like, well, what was wrong with what we were doing before? And uh, can we learn something from this? And the short answer is that what had, in the theory that we've been doing up to then, we hadn't thought about the effects of the steps on the interface. And this ratio is actually a very sensitive measure of how far you are for the nearest interface step. So if you move your dot around, you can actually figure out where your steps are. And this is very interesting because again, this interface is buried and all the usual ways you have of measuring properties of surfaces aren't open to you because you can't take an STM and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and scan it because you're, you know, you're scanning the top and you can't scan like a, 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 you know, an interface sits down in the middle of your sample. But by moving your dot around and measuring the, this ratio, you can figure out where your steps are. Oops, that didn't work. Okay, so, um, uh, and so basically, I want to tell you about this partly because uh, the, the, theory, the theory is really nice and partly because this is a new way of being able to probe what your interface looks like, okay. Um, and so uh, I just gonna, these are the results and then I, I'm gonna show you a little bit of how the theory was done uh, just so you get some sense of like the kind of calculations that we do. So again, um, if you have, uh, no interface steps, then the electron and electron interactions do, uh, you know, really don't affect the uh, single triplet splitting. Okay. But when you do have a step, when you do have a step and the electrons near a step, then you get a big Coulomb, uh, effect of Coulomb interactions. And that leads to this big difference. Okay. So basically when this ratio is big, then you're near a step. Okay. And, uh, and so then uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the theory we did and, uh, and, and sort of how we can do all that in the experiment. Okay, so this step, uh, this, this slide is just to try to argue why when you do the calculation, the effects of the interactions are so small. Okay, and there is, there's been previous work by several groups uh, pointing this out. Um, but um, this is just sort of summarizing. Okay, so, so this, is, th this is done not, uh, this was done in a case where the confinement is done, uh, you know, in the heterostructure itself, as opposed to the electric field, but that's just because it's easier to draw. And these are the two valley states. And what you're supposed to again notice is that the, the envelope of these two states, the envelopes are really quite similar. Right. And since the envelopes are similar, like every time you do a Coulomb integral, the Coulomb integrals come out to be more or less the same, right? And that's the fundamental physics underlying why the Coulomb effects are not important when you do, you know, pure valley states. But what happens is if you add steps, then what happens is that the wave functions distort, okay? And the two different valleys distort in slightly different ways. And, and it turns out that that mixes that, that causes these integrals to no longer cancel in the same way. That's the simple picture. The actual uh, theory is done uh, use, use, using a multi-scale approach where basically what you do is in order to, to put that atomistic uh, configuration of the of quantum well in, you know, we actually do a, a tight binding model with individual atoms. And then the interface is just put in by, you know, just making, we actually make, uh, 
sort of average atom. So we have a silicon germanium atom and then we have a silicon atom. Okay, but that with this very well-defined step, but that is put in quite easily using, um, uh, uh, you know, in the tight binding model. And then we just do a bunch of configurations of, um, of you know, putting in with, you know, very similar, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, so you, you can just put in, you know, you can put in your, uh, uh, your interface step in this sort of very sort of deterministic way. Okay, and then what you do is you just solve for the single particle eigenstates of that Hamiltonian and then do what's called full configuration interaction um, calculation, where you take that basis and then put in the electron and electron interactions and calculate all the integrals between all of the, you know, single particle basis states that you made Slater determinants of. Okay, so, and then you go to convergence. And so these calculations are converged. So basically you did tight binding, you found a bunch of single particle levels, you made Slater determinants, and then you just did the Coulomb interactions until it converged, All right? That's what the calculation is. And uh, again, what you find is, um, uh, oh, and this is the step where we did an electrostatic calculation to figure out where the dot is, which I will skip because I'm running short on time. Um, anyway, and so this is the calculation. It's, it's, it's quite involved, but again, it's, 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 it's a well-defined technique and, that you can implement. And then you can find the eigenstates. Okay, so here you are where you're not very close to a step. And these are the two states. This is the ground state and the lowest valley excited state. Okay, so you're not near a step, so they look quite similar. The orbital state is quite different. And so you can see you do the Coulomb integrals with this guy, you'll get big interaction effects. But when you do Coulomb interactions with, with this guy, um, you get small effects between you know, the singlet and the triplet made out of the sky. And uh, that's what you see. Okay, so here with no steps, the singlet and the triplet, the valley triplet are very similar. These are charge densities, they look very similar. Whereas the orbital triplet is quite different, but when you're near the step, then you get this mixing. And then what this is, is a characterization of the, uh, how much of the different uh, uh, single particle states are in that two particle wave function. And the fact that the sky is green is telling you that it's quite a bit different than the sky, which is blue. Okay. So, um, uh, and so basically that's how we can figure out where the, where the, where the step is. And so basically from, from the, uh, this guy is where the dot is, and then this is the ratio. And then we actually can figure out like how, where the step is. And by putting the step here, we can make the electrostat from the electrostatic calculations and the measurements of this ratio, we can figure out that we move the dot basically almost all the way between two steps. Oh, and I forgot to say, the, the precision with which you can do this is, is, is just a few nanometers. Um, and so we think moving forward, this is going to be really interesting because now we have a way of addressing how good our interfaces are. Interface steps are bad from the point of view of valley splitting. They make the valley splitting go down. And so now we can go, we can grow, we can figure out how far apart our steps are, and we can fix our growth to reduce the number of interface steps. So uh, that's, uh, those were the things, the points I wanted to make. So first I um, uh, wanted to say that the quantum dot qubits are promising. And there I'm just basically saying, well, Levin's hopefully just completely convinced you that silicon, silicon germanium heterostructures can host you know, high quality qubits and you know, potentially scalable architecture. Um, increasing in terms of the work that we did that I showed you, again, that we think we have a new method that is quite implementable for increasing the valley splitting and, um, uh, and by putting germanium in the well. And, uh, and so we're very excited to see if that is borne out by experiment. And then finally, uh, I wanted to tell you about how by comparing um, the singlet triplet splitting and the single particle splitting, you learn about the effects of Coulomb interactions, which are very sensitive to interface steps, and that can be used to uh, um, characterize the interface steps and, um, um, and, and be able to really sort of make more progress on improving the buried interfaces and, and in order to come up with ways to 
again, increase the reliability and scalability of silicon, silicon, germanium qubits. And I, that's what I want to say. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sue. We have time for a couple of questions. All right, Sue, so Jeremy's gonna step up to the microphone here and has one for you. Okay, all right. Hi, Sue, thanks, um, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, that's really an encouraging results. I have a question that I, you probably, I've probably asked you before and you probably answered and now I forgot. Um, why do you uh, not like the, the valley degree of freedom so much? I mean, it seems like it's a, it's a cube, an extra qubit. I mean, do you not have enough like gate control or is it, I mean, it seems like there's a potential, I don't know like what the coherence times or anything would be, but. Oh, oh okay. Um, so that's a separate question, but um, I, there are sort of two ways to go. One is to try to use it and um, to use the value of degree freedom. And in some sense, that's without, we did some work on what, what we called the quantum dot hybrid qubit. And that was exactly that, like taking advantage of the value of degree freedom. Um, it didn't go well with this, with this talk because in order to make it really work, again, if you, again I've, I've gotten into the thing of like, oh, you wanna make it so that you could make a whole bunch of qubits that are all exactly the same. Okay. and the valley splitting has been one of these things where, again, you know, you make a you make a heterostructure, and some fraction of the time, which is not negligible, the valley splitting is not what you want it to be, and um, and and you can still do a lot of really good science, you know, if if you have some reasonable fraction of the time that it is what it wants to be. But if you if you're sort of you know again, oh, here's my chip from Intel with however many billion transistors on it. Uh, you want it to be, you know, uh, you know, you want it to be like, you know, that, you know, what you're going to get and, you know, two ways to do it. One is you can tune it to get to where you want, but the other way is to make it, you know, the, the Crisp row will, will, will just start with an atom. That's the same, you know, all the atoms are the same. Um, and, and so the, so the, the quantum dot hypercube was, was exactly that. Like, can we use the value degree of freedom? Okay, but then, but then this thing about how do you make it, what, how do you get that value splitting to be what you want it to be? And what happened, um, and what happened was like merit, I, and I will say like, I've been working, I won't, well, I will. I've been working on value splitting since 2000 and I think our first paper was 2004, okay. And, and then merit came up with this, oh, but you do this and you do this and look, you just, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, he looked at the stuff that we had done years ago and just in this way where you're like, I could have thought of that, but I didn't think of that. Okay. But the point is that that, that, that increases the scale because basically it's a square root of N, right? And, and, and you just made N a lot bigger. But what that means is it, it becomes less predictable. So that, therefore I focused on a, if you make it big enough, then you're just back to what you had before and you can make the qubits that Levin's making and that Jason's making. And, you know, you can make those and you never have to worry about it because it's so big. Okay, so that was the focus today. If we can figure out how to tune it and make it what we want, then, then again, sort of, that was a separate line of work of like, well, maybe you could use it, but I'm, I'm all excited about this because it's such a simple idea and it looks like it could really, you know, work, but it doesn't make it more tunable. It just makes it bigger, if you know what I'm saying. So thanks for the question. It was, um, uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. Okay. Uh, I see Thank another you. one from Emily. Yeah. Do you Hi, want me to read Emily. It? Yeah. Oh, the impact on T2 star. Um, yeah. So we don't know in detail, okay? We think, so the, so the point is well, what happens when you put germanium in the well? Okay, so one thing is that I, I, Mark Erickson is gonna talk, I guess not today, but um, he'll talk and you can ask him because again, that's been one of the things. And actually one of our very first paper, I think was with Levin putting a germanium spike in the well. And um, uh Again, if you believe that it, okay, if you believe that the decoherence time, T2 star is just, you know, sort of a, a decoherence time. 
and it's a question of what you think the mechanism is. Okay. And uh, in, 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 um, um, in silicon qubits, if, you, if you're not an isotopically purified silicon, then, um, then you have to worry about the, the nuclear spins. And that will change, okay. And again, if you don't use isotopically purified germanium, then you will take a hit. But, but again, that's just a detail at some level of using isotopically purified germanium. So then you're worried about the charge noise, which again, Levin brought up. And uh, there, again, because germanium and silicon are sort of electrically so similar, they're just like one level down on the periodic table. There's sort of, and, and you know, and, and it's a uh, epitaxial um, a growth. You know, you put the atoms in, and everything's epitaxial, and you're not introducing defects. As, you know, when you're when, when you have a really high end uh, growth process, we think it, it shouldn't be uh, de uh, deleterious to the charge noise. Okay. That being said, you know, you have to do the experiment, and Mark Erickson has been doing experiments along those lines. And in fact, the the Wiggle Well experiment was like that. So certainly, you can make quantum dots, and they seem fine. I don't know if he's made qubits, but I'll say you can ask him when he talks. How's that? Or, or ask him in the break. Um, but but again, from the theory point of view, it should be fine. Okay. But but the answer to your question of do we know that it's fine until you do it you don't know that it's fine it, i'm sure as anyone who's talked to a theorist knows that all right thanks for that sue we're out of time uh, thank you for joining us and let's all applaud sue and thank you for the nice results all right we're gonna transition to andrea morello good morning andrea good morning good evening Good morning or late night there for you. I don't know. That's right. <laughs> All right, we'll get your slides up and I'll give you a proper introduction. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Let's see, can you see my full slide? Hear me okay? Yeah, that looks good. Beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah, great. I think we're ready to go. So, Andrea Morello is a Sienta professor of quantum engineering at UNSW in Sydney. And uh, did a postdoc, or was a grad student in, in Leiden, actually, and then went to a UBC as a postdoc, you know, before starting up an ambitious program at Sydney. And I think, you know, Andrea kind of owns this field of the donor spin qubits, especially the implanted ones. And if you're not familiar with this paper, look it up right now. It's Morello 2010. It's the first demonstration of, you know, single shot readout of the electronic spin state of a, a donor bound electron in silicon, a, a really fantastic result that built on the Elzerman experiment demonstrating single spin readout in Gallium arsenide five or six years earlier. And then you know, there's a nice cascade of following results from Andrea's group, but papers by PLA that you should be aware of demonstrating nuclear spin readout. Um, and I think today we're gonna hear about hopefully flip-flop qubits and control of donor spins, both electron and nuclear spins using electric and magnetic field. So thanks for joining us, Andrea. Uh, good morning there. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Jason. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, uh, tell you about the latest things that have been happening in my lab. I'm gonna give you a bit of an overview of what's, uh, what's going on, what we've done and where we're going. And so I, I tried to find a title that more or less captures bit of the variety of what you will hear about. And so you'll hear about the latest results on uh, donor spin qubits using uh, magnetic fields to control them, which is the standard way, but also a couple of new uh, directions where we use electric fields to control the spins, which is a little more unusual, but as I'm sure most of you will appreciate, is actually a very interesting uh, capability when you want to build something that can be easily integrated on a chip and scaled up. So I'm going to start with, um, the slides move, there's always a little lag, okay. With a little overview of the donor qubits in silicon, actually Jason has already done it in his own introduction to some extent. Um, so from, from the point of view of really getting experiments working, um, things started to, to look bright in 2010 when we were finally able to see uh, individual electron spins of single donors in silicon in single shot. 
And then from there, of course, once you've, um, once you've actually achieved spin readout, then doing coherent control of the spins of, of you know, natural quantum systems like atoms, which is what donors in silicon are, is not that hard. This was the, in 2012, it was actually the first uh, spin qubit in silicon. You see the little Rabi oscillation there at the bottom. It's a, it's a Rabi oscillation. It's not the greatest one you've seen. Um, it gets much better when you look at the nuclear spin qubit. The nucleus is a far more coherent system than the electron, and it can be operated nu during, using nuclear magnetic resonance and then read out using the electron as an ancilla qubit for the reader using essentially a, a, an electron nuclear C0 gate. And then things really started looking bright for us in 2014 when we moved from natural silicon, which is the, the, the material that, that was used for the 2012 and 2013 papers. And we moved to uh, isotopically enriched silicon 28, which was and still is given to us by our colleague and friend Koito in Japan. So this is a 2014 result where we show 35 seconds coherence time for the nuclear spin qubit of a phosphorus donor. So these are really mind blowing uh, coherence times when you think about it. This is a fully functional, you know, silicon uh, metal oxide semiconductor device. And yet you can get a half a minute coherent object in there. And then from there, really things become easy, right? Once you have this kind of coherence time, this control, you don't need to rush <laughs> making fast gates, everything kind of works. So in 2015, we showed what was one of the um, key components of the original Kane proposal, which was really the, the, the theoretical idea that spearheaded the silicon quantum computing. The idea is that when you have atoms in a chip, atoms are all identical in principle. And so if you have a global, a radio frequency field that does you know, nuclear magnetic resonance or, or, or electron spin resonance on the atoms, how do you decide which atom you're going to operate on? And so the idea here is that you can do so by applying a local gate voltage that modifies the wave function of the electron and therefore changes the resonance frequency locally of the atom that you want to operate on. So this we demonstrated in 2015. And then again, in 2015, we started doing randomized benchmarking on uh, our qubit, and we got 99.99% fidelity on the nuclear spin. And then a little bit later, uh, we showed 99.94% fidelity on the electron spin using, uh, using gate set tomography. We also were able, of course, to entangle the electron and the nucleus, make really high quality Bell state, um, that still is the highest Bell violation in silicon. And then, uh, since then, of course, the effort was, okay, we've got this, you know, beautiful single atom qubits that are highly coherent. They've got an electron and a nuclear spin, but how do we actually scale them up? So that has been a bit of a slow process at the start, but as I will show you today, we are really accelerating this, uh, this process. And so in 2021, for example, we were able to show that we can um, make uh, conditional quantum operations, essentially C0 gates on uh, exchange couple pairs of donor qubits. We actually have quite advanced uh, experiment in the lab going on right now where we are you know, benchmarking the two qubit logic gates for electrons coupled by exchange interaction. But today I don't have time to talk about it. So I'll tell you a few other things. Anyway, just as a, as a basis for what we're going to do, basically the structure is this uh, silicon chip with a, about a micron thick epi layer of enriched silicon 28, so that there is only an 800 parts per million residual fraction of silicon 29. So it gives us this super long coherence time, high fidelity single qubit operation. It's a really, really pleasant platform to work on. Uh, also just, for those of you maybe not terribly familiar with silicon, you've heard Sue uh, talking about valley splitting, which is, um, is a key aspect of the physics of quantum dots. 
in the donors, value splitting is not an issue. The value split, the, the value orbit splitting of a donor is uh, 11 milli electron volts. It's huge. It's hundreds of Kelvin. That's because of the very tight confining potential. So the value degree of freedom for all intents and purposes doesn't matter. Um, so we fabricate these devices. What's nice about them, in, in my opinion, is that they're really made with the same um, fabrication pathway that is compatible with classical silicon electronic devices, right? So this is just metal, silicon oxide, and aluminum gates on top. There is nothing particularly fancy here. And the atom, and then we have this um, uh, microwave uh, antenna terminated by a short circuit that delivers oscillating magnetic fields for both the electron and the nuclear spin. The atoms are introduced by ion implantation, which again is the same technique that is used in classical silicon nanoelectronics. And so there is a, there is a pathway to compatibility with you know, industry standards. I just wanna say a quick word about um, the ion implantation uh, part. Um, so everything I will show you today was done implanting atoms in a, in a let's call it non-deterministic way. So we normally open a 100 by 100 nanometer uh, window in a PMMA mask and we sprinkle a few uh, donors in that region. And then by massaging the gate potential, we can single out a particular donor that we want to operate on. And this works very well and there's no issue with that. But uh, eventually, if you, uh, you want to be able to make, you know, deterministic arrays of precisely located donors if you want this thing to actually scale up. And here, together with my collaborator, uh, David Jamieson at the University of Melbourne, we've done some really, um, really significant progress lately. So in my group, we developed the um, and fabricate the single ion on-chip detector. So we add some structures to the chip such that when an atom uh, hits the chip, we can detect a, um, a charge signal created by the electron hole pairs produced by the impact. And at the University of Melbourne, they integrate all of this in a structure which has a cantilever with a very tiny hole through which it acts like a movable mask. And, and then there is some very sophisticated detection electronics that actually picks up this signal from the chip. And this thing works so well that we now have 99.87% detection confidence for a single phosphorus ion at 14 kilo electron volts implantation energy, which is the normal energy we use to place the donors about 10 nanometers below the interface. So this is really a breakthrough for us. It means that we have essentially completely deterministic capacity to place individual donors in the chip. And so we are now integrating this with a normal process flow and looking at making really counted deterministic single donor devices. But just keep in mind, everything I will tell you from now on was not done using this technique yet. This is very, very fresh. It's on the archive, but it will appear soon in uh, advanced materials. Okay, so let me show you what is essentially the state of the art in this, um, in this platform at the moment. So it's geometric two cubic gates for nuclear spin qubits. So at the beginning that the nuclear spin qubits are you know, the most uh, high fidelity and long coherence uh, qubits, but there's always this lingering doubt in the, in, the, in the mind of anyone who operates in this field is that, okay, but how do you actually scale them up? How do you make them interact with each other? Because of course they're very isolated from the environment and they don't talk to each other very much. So um, the structure we use, this is a, the common structure we've been using for all um, multi-qubit gate operations in the last couple of years, including for electrons, is, is the same one you've seen before. So we've got this big uh, microwave antenna. We've got four gates to control the um, donor potential. And we got a single electron transistor for uh, spin-dependent tunneling charge readout. Um, in this particular batch of devices, because we were looking for um, closely spaced donors so that they would have a significant exchange interaction, we ramped up the dose of the implantation and designed it in such a way that the typical distance between the donors would be around 8, 10 nanometers. Okay? 
And so we measured a number of devices from the, this batch and they're all very interesting, but I wanna focus on this one. Uh, what you see here is the electron spin resonance spectrum. So you see the frequencies at which the electron spin uh, responds and there's four of them. Right? So four of them means that there are two nuclear spins determining the resonance of that electron. If you had a single donor, there would be two frequencies depending on the orientation of the nucleus. Here you have four, so there's two nuclei. And you can independently confirm that. Um, you can actually remove the electron. Actually, no, so with the electron in place, you can do nuclear magnetic resonance and see at what frequency the nucleus responds. And they see there's actually two of them. So this is a system of two nuclear spins sharing the same electron, okay? Uh, so it's a three qubit system. There's two nuclei, one electron. Uh, it's an eight level system. And because the uh, electron nuclear couplings are different, you see the hyperfine to nucleus number one is 95 megahertz and to nucleus number two is nine megahertz. Um, all the frequencies are completely well separated. So we have full control of this eight dimensional Hilbert space with very high fidelity. There is no crosstalk. There is no, you know, uh, proximity of the control frequencies. So this is a nice artist impression of what the device looks like. So you see this wave function that overlaps two donors, but is much more concentrated on one of the two. Um, we have done some um, effective mass uh, sort of wave function calculations, including electric fields to try and find what is the distance between the donors and the electric field that will match the hyperfine couplings that we see. And essentially the only way to make it work, which makes sense, is to imagine that these two donors are about 6.5 6 nanometers apart. And there's a field of two megavolts per meter, which is what you typically find in this structure. And also that this is the third electron of the cluster. So if you look up here, you could have you know, two donors and one electron, but what we actually have, and we know that from, from other considerations, including the electron T1, what we actually have is the three electron system. So there's two electrons tightly bound in a singlet state, which is a spin zero, and then the third electron on the top is actually the one that we are operating. All right, now, what do we do with this system? We can do something really interesting, which is a control Z, nuclear two qubit logic gate. We haven't invented this. This is um, it's actually done at least in the solid state that I don't know of. It was first done in the group of John Morton using some, some ensemble experiments. The idea is very simple. You have basically a native Toffoli gate here, right? So you have a qubit whose resonance frequency depends on the state of two other qubits. So if you do a pi pulse on that qubit, that's a Toffoli gate. If you do a two pi pulse on that qubit, you impart a geometric phase and uh, our own of Anandan phase to the branch of the two qubits that control the electron. And so for example, in this, in this example here, if I do a two pi rotation on the electron conditional on both nuclei being in the spin down state, I get this control Z matrix, which is a nuclear two qubit gate. It's super simple. It's one pulse on the electron. And then of course you can sandwich it between pi over two pulses and that gives you C naught gate. So uh, we got a nuclear C naught gate. That's actually quite remarkable. Um, in a very simple operation. So here's an example where we use these C naught gates and we kind of map them. So we have, um, we feed as the control nucleus um, a state which is Rabi oscillated. So the yellow is the Rabi oscillation of the control qubit. And then we look, then we apply this C naught gate for the nuclei and we look at the output on the target nucleus and you see that the target nucleus oscillates with the exact opposite phase as the control, as you would expect. You can change the conditioning. So what kind of um, ESR line you do the two qubit operation on. So you do the two pi pulse on. And so with that, you get the zero C naught gate, which is the one where you flip the target um, conditional on the control being in the zero state. And now you see that the target and the control rabi oscillate in phase. Um, if you stop halfway, so if you feed 
into the control input a QB that is in a superposition state, you get a bell state, maximal entangled bell state. You can do that. You can do a bell state tomography and uh, extract the bell state fidelities and you get values that are very high. They are in the well above 90%. And I want to stress here that these are raw values that are not corrected for readout errors. For, for, uh, for historical reasons and for practical reasons, it is, it is common practice in the quantum dots community in, uh, in semiconductors to always extract out the preparation and readout fidelities from, from bell states. In, um, for nuclear spins of donors, we don't need to do that because our readout fidelity is 99 point something percent, as I will show you in a moment. So we, we just leave it there. And then we've done, uh, we started collaborating with the um, QPL group at Sandia National Lab, uh, led by Robin Bloom Kohut, together with also Kenny Rudinger, Kevin Young, Eric Nielsen, Tim Proctor. So we had this whole army of. Uh, um, of gate tomography experts who uh, really went to town with us. They got very excited about having a system that is so, you know, rich. And so they, we, we applied two qubit gate set tomography, which is a technique that has, has existed for some time, but in fact, they have developed it uh, way beyond the point at which it was until, you know, a year ago. And so they've helped us really understanding what are the types and of course quantity of errors that we have in our system. So they were able to um, break down on every qubit and on the two qubit control Z operation, what is an intrinsic coherent error, so essentially decoherence, uh, relational coherent error. So intrinsic coherent errors is actually what we would call a miscalibration, crudely speaking relational coherent error. This is an interesting one. When you do, let's say, a, say you want to do a pi on two pulse along X and a pi on two pulse along Y, those pi on two pulses could be absolutely perfect by themselves, but there might be an angle between them that is not 90 degrees. So then it's kind of arbitrary which pulse, which gate you, uh, you um, attribute the infidelity to. And gate set tomography tells you that the rotations are perfect, but it's the phase between them that's wrong. And then in blue, in blue you get the stochastic error, which is basically decoherence. Uh, all of this is obtained by analyzing some large uh, two qubit process matrices. Um, and what we also, so this is a whole table, I don't expect you to uh, look it up, but the bottom line is that basically we are at 99% fidelity on everything. Uh, so this is the beautiful uh, diagram of relational errors. So for the individual single qubit gates and the, for the two qubit control Z gate, we can tell what is the relation between the gates in terms of how much of an error can be shuffled between the two. Now, the spam errors, I was mentioning before, um, we don't need to uh, extract the readout errors from our you know, bell state tomographies or other stuff, because effectively our, our state preparation measurement fidelity is 99% here, which is really quite peculiar. The reason why, by the way, I haven't had time to explain it, but that's because nuclear spin qubits can be read out in a quantum non-demolition mode. So they're read out via the electron, but in a repetitive way. So we typically do 30 shots on each nucleus. And so that really shrinks down your initial intrinsic readout error, which can be as, as high as 20%. So let's look at what this means in terms of you know, quantum information processing, right? So people get very excited when you, when you start talking about 99% fidelities, because this is taking you close to what is known to be the fault tolerance threshold for the surface code, right? And so if you actually, and I want to mention here, um, I know that uh, Levin spoke before me while I was still in bed. Um, so from Levin van der Seipen's group, there is this beautiful result that's on the archive showing um, over 99% fidelities to qubit gates. And then about a month later, something similar came out from the group of Seigo Tarucha in Japan. All of this in silicon, silicon, germanium, quantum dots. 
So really the whole community is ramping up to this kind of uh, gate fidelities which are approaching the uh, fault tolerance thresholds for the surface code. So let's have a look at, you know, this is a classic paper that people cite because it's very experimentalist friendly where you actually break down uh, all the operations you do in a surface code cycle and what kind of errors come up in an operation like that, right? So the, the single qubit fidelities are the ones that come in step one and step three, right? So um, keeping a data qubit in, in a certain state, so doing the identity operation or doing Hadamard operations on the measure qubit. And then there's the two qubit fidelity, which we have to do C naughts between the measure qubit and the data qubits. Um, and then there is the spam. So actually being at the false tolerance threshold for the surface code requires being at 99.43% on all of these benchmarks. It's not just the gate fidelity. So this is the thing I really wanna highlight. One of the greatest properties of donor spin qubits, particular nuclear spin qubits, is that the spam error is also at the 99% level. And so this, this really makes a difference when it comes to scaling up. And I'll show you in a moment already how it, it pans out. So the, the Typical objection to nuclear spin qubits is how do they scale, right? So um, they're great, but how do you make them talk to each other? Here, okay, we've had this special case where they were both um, bound to the same electron, and so that's nice, but of course you can't make, you know, thousand nuclei bound to the same electron. Well, you can, but then it's difficult to identify them. So what we really want to do is to entangle this nuclei with that electron, and then once you've done that, it becomes plausible to imagine scaling up that, that unit by using the electron as the mediator of further interaction between other groups of nuclei. So you can do uh, exchange coupling between electron spins. Um, so there's, there's some results from my group and there's some results from Michelle Simon's group on this in donors and of course many more in quantum dots. Um, one thing I'll talk about in a moment is the electric dipole coupling um, between flip-flop qubits. You can even shuttle the electron, right? There's some beautiful results from, uh, from Andrew Zurak's group where they showed that in quantum dot system, you can um, move electrons between quantum dots while preserving the coherence of the spin of the electron. And also you can... Um, couple the electron to, for example, in this case, a silicon 29 nucleus and move the electron on and off while keeping track of the phase of the silicon 29 nucleus. And then of course, if you um, wanna scale that up even bigger, you can um, couple electrons to uh, microwave resonators. And of course, Jason has been one of the pioneers in this field. And so you can envisage um, using microwave photons as extended buses to connect electrons at, at, at various distances. And in fact, Jason's group himself, they have this beautiful paper that came out recently where they show how to, for example, measure nuclear spins via uh, a cavity field. So all of these opens up a whole uh, range of possibilities once you have the nuclei entangled with the electrons. So let's try and do that. So we want to do a GHZ state, a Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger state, which is simply one over root two, up, 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 plus down, down, down. Um, the sequence to do that is really simple because we have a native Toffoli gate, as I said. You basically have the, every, every, every qubit has a resonance that depends on the state of the other two. So you just uh, feed them to the circuit, and then you can reverse the evolution. So you do this three pulse, you get a GHZ state, and you can see, you can measure the populations at every step. So you see it's now one half, one half. And then you can reverse it and you get about 90% return probability. Again, including spam errors without taking anything out. Um, this is all very nice, but this doesn't prove that you actually have entanglement, right? You need to see the off diagonal elements of the density matrix for that. And so for this, we use a method that is called parity scan in uh, trapped ions. It's used also in superconductors. Uh, I discovered recently there's some, some work from IBM where they do same, essentially the same thing to, uh, to benchmark GHZ states. 
Um, for us, this is important because we have, it's a heterogeneous quantum processor. So we have two qubits, the nuclei that are long coherence time, but also slow operations. And then a third qubit, which has fast operation, but shorter coherence time. So if you do the sort of standard state tomography, by the time you do the rotations on the nuclei, your electron starts to dephase. And so it gives you an artificially suppressed fidelity of the state. Whereas what you do here is that you reverse the, the GHZ state using pulses that have a, a phase accumulation. And so your return probability oscillates. And when you fit that oscillation, you get the off diagonal elements of the density matrix. The nice thing about the GHZ state is that you don't need to get the full density matrix to see uh, with what fidelity you created it, because when you do you know, the fidelity product, basically the, the, the GHZ state, the ideal state has got non-zero elements only at the four corners. So those, those are the only ones that count in the end. So here we got 92.5% uh, fidelity of the GHZ state, three qubit and tango state, as usual, including spam errors. Um, in silicon, silicon germanium quantum dots, the Tarucha group showed an 88% uh, GHC state uh, fidelity, which looks superficially similar, but that was done after removing the spam errors. If you actually look in the method section of the paper, you'll find that when you re without removing spam, the fidelity is 45.8%. So this really is an alarm bell, right? So it's nice to remove spam errors, but Already, once you get to three qubits, the errors really pile up, and eventually you're left with almost nothing to, to, to grasp. Um, okay, so this is all I wanted to say about you know standard you know magnetic resonance control of qubits. I want to say a few words about electrical control of qubits. So, um, there is this idea that we published in 2017 and we now have experimentally demonstrated is the electron nuclear flip-flop qubit. So the idea here is the following. A single phosphorus donor has uh, four states, right? So it's a two qubit system, an electron and a nucleus. And so normally you would, let's say, if you want to operate just the electron by itself, you fix the nucleus in a certain um, orientation and then you just operate the electron there. So you pick two states like this, or you can pick two states like that if you want the nucleus. You can also go across. So if you pick the up, down, down, up combinations of the electron and nuclear states, that is also a qubit, and we call it the flip-flop qubit for obvious reasons. You cannot do magnetic resonance to control this qubit because the, the delta M is zero, so there's no matrix element of a magnetic field between those states but you can do electric dipole spin resonance. So if you um, apply an oscillating voltage to the gate above the donor, you can oscillate the hyperfine coupling. And this appears as a sigma X term in the truncated spin Hamiltonian of the flip-flop qubits on the flip-flop qubit block sphere. And so this um, electrical control by modulating the isotropic component of the hyperfine interaction gives you coherent control of the uh, flip-flop states. Uh, the device is more or less the same as usual, except we also now have an electric high-frequency antenna. So there's a coplanar waveguide terminated by a short circuit for magnetic control, that's the one on the left, and another coplanar waveguide terminated by an open circuit for electrical control, which is the one we use to control the flip-flop qubit. This is more or less what the device looks like from above. And again, this was done on a um, chip that was implanted with a fairly high dose of phosphorus. And so you see all those cuts in the stability diagram constitutes charge transitions of different donors. So we operated on this one. But the thing I want you to keep in mind is that because of all those other donors in the vicinity, we had a fairly limited gate range where we could pulse our gates. And so we were not able to pull the electron all the way up to the interface and give it a really big electric dipole, we had to work on a fairly small range. Nonetheless, the experiment worked. So we were able to demonstrate Rabi oscillations of the flip-flop qubit. And the nice thing here is that you can read out the electron first and then read out the nucleus and you can actually really see the flip-flopping, this uh, probability of these electron and nuclear spins 
oscillating in time in opposite phase. Uh, the Rabi frequency is about 100 kilohertz, not that great because, as I said, the electric dipole is small. We cannot pulse the gates further enough to pull out the electron and give it a big electric dipole, but this can be resolved using the counted single ion implantation that we now have the capability to put into place. Still, this is already five times faster than the fastest NMR we've ever done, if you look at it from the nuclear spin point of view. It's a nice little lobby chevron. Um, so we've done gate set tomography here and uh, the fidelities are around 98% on this device because the gates are slow. Uh, also keep in mind that gate set tomography assumes that your system is Markovian and it sort of puts up a flag when it notices that it's not and this system is non-Markovian as we all know in semiconductor qubits there is one over F noise and nuclear spin noise um, that can affect your operation. Okay, now still on the topic of uh, electrical control, this was a completely unexpected result. Um, so in the flip-flop qubit, the electrical control is brought about by electrically modulating the electron wave function, which is something that makes sense, right? You're modulating a charge. Um, for nuclear qubits, this is, uh, well, it was a complete surprise to us. Um, we started working on donors other than phosphorus a couple of years ago. So we started working on antimony for reasons that have nothing to, well, very little to do with quantum computation. I have an ongoing project on looking at quantum chaos in high spin nuclei. I find it really fascinating. And so for that, you need a nucleus that has a nuclear quadrupole moment. So phosphorus won't do it because it's a spin one half. But if you go down the periodic table, every other group five donor in silicon actually has a quadrupole moment. And antimony 123 is the biggest one. It has a spin seven half and it's a very nice donor to use with. So we started making devices with antimony 123. And what we found was something fascinating. We found something that we did expect. We found a quadrupole split a nuclear spin resonance spectra. So here you see these, uh, you see the six uh, resonance lines here. The funny thing is that there should be seven, right? It's an eight level system. There should be seven resonances between them, but we only saw six out of the seven. And we also saw as expected though, the uh, delta M equal two uh, resonances at twice the frequency because you have quadratic terms in the nuclear spin Hamiltonian. What causes the splitting of those lines is actually the static strain in the device, okay? So silicon is normally a cubic uh, diamond structure semiconductor, but when you put aluminum gates on top and you cool it down to low temperature, there is a differential thermal contraction of the stack of materials. And so there is actually a significant uh, strain that's built into the device. And this breaks the cubic symmetry of the silicon lattice and causes um, and causes a static nuclear quadrupole splitting, which is what separates these resonance lines. Um, so this is like an atomic scale strain sensor, if you will, right? And so this gives you, um, when you analyze it in detail, and that's in this paper you see the reference of, you get the S tensor. So the tensor that um, relates lattice strain to electric field gradient. The other interesting thing though, is that as we found out through a number of, of, of reasons, uh, including there being no, I mean, the first one was that this resonance was absent. So the minus one half plus one half uh, nuclear resonance just wasn't there. Uh, this is understood once you realize that what we were doing in fact was not nuclear magnetic resonance, but nuclear electric resonance. So this is actually the, scanning electron micro micrograph of the actual device we measured after we took it out of the fridge. And you see that this antenna is blown up, right? So we passed, it was a thin, thin short circuit here. We passed too much current. This is probably electromigration actually. So the short circuit of the antenna melted down and electromigrated and turned into an open circuit. So what we were doing was not applying oscillating magnetic field, but applying oscillating electric field through what was nominally the magnetic antenna. 
And then once we understood what we were doing, we started using just the gates here on the device because they're actually even closer to the donor, so they couple even stronger. And so you see, this is a beautiful uh, nuclear rabi oscillation. It's slow, slow, so it's, you know, kilohertz kilohertz uh, frequency, but because we are in silicon 28, you know, this is perfectly fine. Um, and so this is an absolute surprise, being able to electrically control nuclear spins thanks to the uh, nuclear quadrupole interaction and, and microscopically because of the fact that the electric field um, distorts the weight functions of the electrons that form the covalent bonds between the um, donor and the nearby silicon atoms. So this gives us, when you do the microscopic analysis, the R tensor, which is the tensor that relates the electric field to the electric field gradient. And this is a little sort of uh, artist video when we did the media splash on this paper to show kind of how really microscopically the electrical drive works, right? So the electric field modulates the bonds which then themselves um, modulate the electric field gradient at the nucleus, which is how you get the electrical drive. There's a little sort of romantic thing about this paper. It was published um, on the 11th of March last year. And the first idea of um, nuclear electric resonance was by Nico Bloombergen, whose 100th birthday was on the day that our papers got, got published. 58 years after he predicted that, finally someone saw it. It was quite, um, it was quite something. All right, and then in the last few minutes that I have, I want to tell you something about yet another direction that we got uh, inspired to take by this um, you know, discovery of nuclear electric resonance. Now we can try and do nuclear acoustic resonance, right? We know the tensor, microscopically, the tensor that relates strain to the electric field gradient. So the question is, can we drive coherent spin transitions mechanically, so using essentially dynamical strain, something like this. Um, nuclear acoustic resonance, again, everything has been done in the 60s, right? <laughs> Anything in spin resonance, you think you're the first, you never are. But, um, and then it was essentially forgotten. There's a very interesting preprint, though, from the long car group at Harvard, where uh, using uh, silicon vacancies in diamond with a carbon-13 coupled to it, they were able to show uh, acoustic drive using uh, surface acoustic waves of this carbon-13 nucleus. In fact, what they actually did was to do acoustic drive of the electron, and then because the electron has an anisotropic hyperfine to the nucleus, they can drive it like that. But this is really starting to become a hot topic, really, just quite recently. And so we started doing some, just some simple modeling to see, can we drive, at least, you know, in theory, we'll do the experiment too, but can we drive um, these nuclear spins using, for example, a little piece of piezoelectric. So we did this uh, console modeling where we um, imagine putting an aluminum nitride little strip of piezoelectric between our donor gates and the, and the single electron transistor. And so these are the strain profiles that you get. Shear strain is the one that dominates. Um, of course, when you drive the uh, piezoelectric, you drive it with an electric field, you drive it with an oscillating voltage. So you will always normally have nuclear electric resonance alongside the nuclear acoustic resonance because you're also applying an oscillating electric field. And, um, but if you sort of design it right, you can um, make sure that in the center of the device, the actual um, electric field is zero. And so it suppresses the nuclear electric resonance and you can see essentially pure nuclear acoustic resonance right here in the center of the device. Um, the, the Rabi frequencies that we expect for some realistic uh, you know, voltages in the drive are about 200, 250 Hertz. So they're not great and they're not any better than nuclear electric resonance. So this was the first question we asked, you know, would you gain something by driving acoustically versus driving electrically? And the answer is no, you don't. But I still think this is an interesting idea because um, you get a really microscopic atomic scale strain sensor where you can benchmark 
not only the static strain that you see from the quadrupolar interaction, but also the dynamic strain, which you can then measure uh, via the Rabi frequency. So I think it's an interesting little curiosity on the side that we're going to try to go experimentally now in the next couple of months. So in terms of where we're going, uh, so most of the things I told you at the beginning were about phosphorus, but we're now moving towards antimony. Antimony is, uh, is essentially a three qubit system. The nucleus itself has an eight dimensional Hilbert space. And there's some really interesting proposals for things to do with, with high spins like this. There's this paper I like a lot from Jonathan Gross, who is now at Google. He used to be at Sherbrooke when he wrote this paper, is to encode the analogous of, of GKP bosonic qubits on this high spin nucleus, right? And so this is the example wave functions, well, yeah, for, for the spin seven half. And this is something we can do very naturally on our antimony qubits. Um, the other thing we can do is to now do all electrical control of the donor atom. We can do nuclear transitions by nuclear electric resonance and then go across with flip-flop transitions uh, to control the electron as well. So you have a fully electrical access to a 16 dimensional Hilbert space. And so coupled with the flip-flop uh, operation, that means that we can have locally electrically controlled electron nuclear qubits. And then once we go to counted single ion implantation and we can actually create large electric dipoles, then these qubits can talk to each other at significant distances of order 200 nanometers, which makes it really interesting from the point of view of scale up. So with this, I've just used all my time. I just want to thank all my fabulous group. Uh, many of the people, uh, many of the names you've seen on the papers that I mentioned before. And also our borders are reopening. The government has promised us that from the 1st of November, it will be possible to resume international travel into Australia. So I hope to see some of you coming and visit us. And certainly we will come and visit you as soon as we can. I hope to see... Uh, most of you at the March meeting, we're really hoping that that will be in person. And if you're interested in uh, joining us for PhDs or postdocs, you have some talented people in your group who are looking for somewhere exciting to go, please put them in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Any takers? All right, Jake Taylor has one. He's going to step up to the microphone here, Andre. Oh, Jake. Hello, Jake. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Sorry, I have to shout. Uh, thank you, Andrea. That's a really wonderful progress. Thank uh, you. So I have kind of a, a more meta question for you. Uh -huh. I know that you just talked a lot about some incredible science. But if you were to characterize the biggest technological impediment to your future progress, and I don't mean tomorrow, I mean over the next five years. Where would the next $100 million go? Um, the next $100 million would go on a um, essentially access to a silicon foundry and integrating the counted single ion implantation with that process. Right. So I think um, it's clear to, to you know, most of us who work in semiconductor qubits that um, we, it's hard for us to make genuine scalable devices in a university clean room, right? So I think it's quite incredible what we've been able to achieve. And I can see another, you know, five or 10 years of, you know, very interesting science and basic operations of, you know, um, qubits in silicon coming out of universities. But eventually for the long term, the reason why we, you know, the reason why we fight all the quirks of silicon is because we want to have chips manufactured using some of the, if not all, at least a large proportion of the technology that underpins the trillion dollar, you know, semiconductor industry that we already have. That is why at the beginning of my talk, I was stressing the fact that these devices are actually MOS devices. They're just silicon oxide and metal gates on top and the donors are introduced by ion implantation. So the next $100 million would be used to really start to integrate this process into the kind of foundry facilities that will give us the reproducibility 
and, and device yield that in a university clean room, we can't really have. I have to say, I'm very pleased with my device yield at the moment. I mean, we now are at, let's call it between 25 and 50% yield on two qubit devices. By yield, I mean, you know, you make a batch of devices and we typically make them in a sort of four by eight array. So there's, you know, more than, you know, a few dozen devices on a little chip, then we cut them up, we bond them. And I'd say one out of four or even one out of two will give us a two cubic gate that works. It's actually remarkable when you think about it. So I'm very pleased with that. But, you know, the... The, the non-yield scales exponentially as you try and make more and more of that. So, so it's clear that you know, this, this needs to be addressed at some point. So I see the job of someone like myself who works at a university as you know, understanding and developing the basic science and the modes of operations of how best to actually operate and couple these qubits. That's been really the spirit of what I tried to show to you today. You know, how many different ways are there to operate these things and how well do they work? What are the gate fidelities? What are the coupling strengths? What are the pros and cons of all that? That's my job in a university. The job of scaling up to a, to a quantum computer that is fault tolerant and works and solves problems that matter to, to, to society is in an industrial setting in a billion dollar founder. So actually 100 million will get us only part of the way there. But yeah, it's no. a start. The engineering start. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Andre, I think we're out of time here. Uh, thanks again for the nice presentation and I'd like yes, to thank sir. all the speakers in the session. All right, have a good day there and we'll see you on the other side of the Pacific That's at some right. point. So uh, thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you to all of the speakers uh, today and all of the chairs as well. Um, so uh, this is the end of today, the main conference, um, but remember uh, that the public lecture, the Crookshank lecture, which is given by Umesh Vazirani, uh, will start at uh, 6 p.m. with a reception and 6.30 p.m. the lecture will start. Um, and that will be in the Beaupre Auditorium, uh, the Chemical and Forensic Sciences Building. So that's north of here. Um, so you can uh, take a look at the campus map uh, if you don't know where that is or find one of us and uh, you can follow us uh, down there. So hope you come to that. Thank you so much.